right. Um, why don't we go ahead and get started? I'm going to hit broadcast. All right, so good afternoon, and welcome to our 1 p.m. session of the November 4th, 2020 study session of the Santa Cruz City Council. I have a few announcements, and then we'll get started with our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming from the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely, and I want to thank the public for staying at home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on uh, using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through your phone. Please note there's a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. <clears throat> when it's time for public comment, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your time to speak during public comment, you'll hear an announcement that, you'll, that you've been unmuted and your timer will be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you've uh, finished commenting on your item. And with that, I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers. Catherine, you're muted. Wow. And I'm muted as now you're, well. Now you're unmuted. You're good. Uh, Matthew? Here. Brown will be late. Golder will be late. Watkins? Here. Vice Mayor Myers will be late. And Mayor Cummings? Here. So uh, next up on our agenda is item number one of general business, State of California Housing Legislation Update 2018 to 2020. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, this is an item you'd like to comment on. Now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to our presenters, Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development, Matt Van Waugh, Principal Planner, and Jessica Malore, Management Analyst. All right, good evening, Council, uh, or good afternoon. <laughs> uh, let me bring this up here. And I'll also be presenting today with uh, Tony Candati, our uh, city attorney. And uh, so th this presentation is on the state of California housing legislation updates from 2018 to 2020. Um, and just so you're aware, there, there's a lot of legislation each year, and uh, a lot of it is fairly obscure, and some of it's also not relevant to the city of Santa Cruz. So we're really focusing here on kind of the most important items that we'll, we'll see uh, coming up in the future and we'll be using day to day. And so with that, I'm gonna provide some background too on this as well. Uh, in addition to the 2018 to 2020, uh, changes that we'll focus on. There are some overarching uh, policy changes in state legislation that uh, that still uh, work through a lot of this other work, and uh, some of this, uh, some of these updates that we're going to present today refer back to some of these as well. And so, uh, the first one of those is the Housing Accountability Act, which has actually been around for almost uh, 40 years. Uh, but was significantly changed in 2017 uh, to really strengthen it. And uh, the, the goal of this, uh, the goal of the Housing Accountability Act was to mean, meaningfully and affecting, uh, meaningfully and affecting curbing the capability of local government to deny, reduce the density of, or render infeasible housing development projects. So since then, there, there have been a lot more state regulations that are, that are playing into uh, our local role in, uh, in housing uh, approval and denial. And the, the Housing Accountability Act also strengthened the housing element's role in requiring and monitoring housing development as well. Uh, another one is the density bonus law, which has also been around a long time, but has since seen uh, has more recent changes. 2002, uh, there were changes to make it more similar to what we know of today. And then in 2014, there was uh, replacement requirements, as well as a change from 30 years of affordability to 55 years of affordability required for uh, the density bonus units. 
And then in 2016, uh, there was increase to the density bonus for specialized populations, and then there was more streamlining changes. Uh, and then SB 35 uh, was also a streamlining uh, measure done, uh, and that's for cities if they're not meeting their uh, arena uh, housing allocation requirements. Uh, SB 2 was a bill that uh, really paved the way for a lot of grant funding for housing development work. Uh, and we're currently using, uh, using some of those SB 2 funds through a grant for the objective standards work, which we'll, which we'll be presenting later. And then finally, SB 743 uh, was largely a change to CEQA and how traffic is measured which really better supports infill housing development is one of its key aims. So with that, I'm gonna go into the 2020 legislation. Um, the, the first two are, or the, the first one is especially important. Uh, and that's AB 2345 and that's the density bonus increase. And the really, the really key thing here is that prior, prior to this, the maximum density bonus uh, afforded to uh, uh, a market rate project was uh, 35%, and that would now be increased to 50% under this, under this, and and that's that's if uh, an applicant does provide additional an additional percentage of uh, of affordable units. So, for instance, uh, previous density bonus law would have allowed a 35% density bonus. Uh, if the applicant is providing 11% very low income unit on the project. Whereas uh, under this law, there will now be, uh, if they provide 15% very low income units, they could, uh, they could receive the 50% density bonus increase. And then the AB 3182 is a, a change to accessory dwelling units, and that's that was really a streamlining measure uh, requiring cities to complete an application a com or uh, act on a complete application within 60 days. Otherwise, it would be deemed approved. And the final two are actually ones that weren't in the staff report, but we thought we would also want to highlight as well to you. And that's AB 81, 80, 1851, and that is uh, allowing uh, religious institutions that have housing development on their parking lots. Uh, the religious institution would or could receive a 50% parking reduction uh, to make way for that development on their property. And then finally, SB 288 uh, was also passed this year and that was to make uh, both bike and transit projects such as uh, bus lanes and bike lanes and uh, bus rapid transit projects, things like that, they would be uh, exempt from CEQA. And so with that, I'm gonna hand that over to uh, Jess Miller, uh, who's analyst in housing to speak more on uh, other legislation from 2020. Thanks, uh, Matt. Uh, so AB 725, um, was a bill that the state um, mandated that, uh, well, the history is the state has mandated that all cities, towns, and counties must plan for housing needs of California residents at multiple income levels. So that's very low, which is generally 50% AMI, low, uh, which is between 50 and 80%, moderate, 80 to 120, and then above moderate, so anything over 120. So we have to provide housing at all those different levels. And so the way the state tracks our accomplishments is through our housing element and regional housing needs allocation, which you may have also heard called RENA. Um, so the state determines how many units are needed and at what levels, and then they, they get doled out to the different jurisdictions. So what AB 725 does is it requires 20% of the above moderate housing needs um, to be on parcel zoned between four and 100 units per acre. And roughly that's almost uh, all the parcels in the city. So we know we're gonna meet that requirement from the state. And this is really, the state was trying to encourage more medium density projects instead of smaller, um, like fewer unit projects, they wanna see more medium density. 
Um, and then we have AB 3308, um, which is kind of part of the Teacher Housing Act of 2016. That was passed to facilitate the acquisition, construction, rehabilitation, and preservation of affordable housing for teachers and school employees. So this bill continues to affirm the state's support of building affordable housing for teachers and school district employees. And it, it's gonna be on school district land. So they own the land already, and it'll allow those district projects to be funded with uh, low-income housing tax credits. So that's uh, the money from, could be from the state or from the federal government. And generally, you can't have preferences for tenants with that kind of funding, but this bill will actually allow school district projects to have that preference, to give uh, preference to teachers and their school district employees, and it'll, it'll make sure that they can maintain eligibility for the federal tax credits. So that, that's those two bills. And Tony? Yes, good afternoon, council members. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna cover two uh, bills. One, eight, seven, uh, SB 872 uh, relates to uh, property insurance. And what this bill does is it streamlines the process for making uh, residential insurance claims for victims of disasters such as wildfires. Um, it also expands the definition of additional living expenses that must be paid to homeowners for losses incurred in a state of emergency to include not just for homes damaged or destroyed, but also additional living expenses for homes that are rendered uninhabitable due to such circumstances as the loss of access to water or power or a building rendered temporarily uninhabitable due to smoke damage or that sort of thing. Uh, I, Upon submission of a claim by a homeowner, uh, it requires an advanced payment of no less than four months for costs, such as housing, furniture, rental, uh, furniture rental and transportation. Uh, it also mandates an advanced payment of no less than 25% of a policy limit for lost content without submission of an inventory form. And it makes insurers give homeowners a 60-day grace period for payment of premiums on uh, property insurance after an emergency. Um, for property owners who elect to use the proceeds uh, from, a, from a destroyed uh, residence to construct a residence on another location, a different piece of property, uh, it bars insurance companies from deducting the land value of the uh, relocated site from payments for those who build on new lots. So in other words, if, you're, um, if the proceeds of your policy would uh, provide enough funds to acquire a replacement property and construct, then it would prohibit um, insurance companies from deducting the, the, the cost of acquiring the property. Um, turning to AB 3088, this uh, deals mostly with, uh, with uh, protections for residential tenants. Um, it prevents residential tenants from facing ev eviction for failure to pay rent from March 1st, 2020 to August 31st, uh, 2020. Um, to avoid b eviction beyond August 31st, tenants must pay at least at least 25% of rent payments from September 1st of 2020 to January 31st of 2021. Um, to receive protection from eviction, the tenants have to file a statement uh, attesting to the fact that they are enduring a pandemic-related hardship. And tenants that make more than $100,000 or more than 130% of the area's median income uh, can be required to submit additional documentation proving their hardship. Um, missed payments from the period of March 1st, 2020 to January 31st, 2021 are converted into consumer debt, which is recoverable by landlords and small claims court uh, to the extent that the amount of outstanding rent would exceed the jurisdiction of the small claims court, it would also increase the, that jurisdiction to cover the full amount owed. Uh, and it preempts local ordinances relating to eviction protections that were modified or extended after uh, August 19th, 2020. 
So this, uh, and this includes ordinances regulating deferred payment plans. Does not cover commercial evictions. As you recall, um, an executive order uh, authorized by the city council <coughs> initially in April and reauthorized in June was extended recently by a, an executive order of Governor Newsom uh, to, I believe, the end of February. Uh, there's also provision in AB 3088 that extends uh, protections for landlords, although it's, it's not as, um, I guess, impactful as the protections for tenants. Uh, it extends the protections set forth in the existing Homeowners' Bill of Rights to small landlords uh, which means uh, those owning res residential property with up to four dwelling units. Um, just like a uh, residential uh, property owner or homeowner, it requires mortgage servicers to contact borrowers before pursuing foreclosure proceedings in order to provide potential forbearance options. It also prohibits dual tracking, what's called dual tracking, where a servicer initiates foreclosure proceedings while considering loan modifications with the borrower. Uh, and finally, where a small landlord is denied a forbearance, the act requires the mortgage servicer to provide a written explanation of the decision as to why. And these anti-foreclosure uh, protections for small landlords are in effect uh, until January 1st of 2023. And that um, covers uh, AB 3088. Thanks, Tony. So we're gonna move on to legislation uh, for 2019. And uh, the first one being this group of bills uh, for accessory dwelling units. And these were actually, uh, these were all brought to council in December of 2019 for approval and, and uh, items under this bill included things like uh, removing parking requirements, and parking replacement requirements and uh, removing lot coverage requirements, as well as uh, increasing the, the square footage allowed uh, for ADUs. And then another ADU bill uh, from 2019 was AB 670, which uh, provided uh, more allowance for ADUs and homeowners associations uh, to, so that they weren't prevented from being built in HOA uh, developments. And then uh, AB 1100 uh, was, was a change to how uh, parking is counted for ADA uh, electric vehicle charging. And so uh, an ADA space that has an electric vehicle charging set up uh, is counted as two spaces towards a parking count. Um, and the largest of the items on this slide is AB 1763, um, which is a density bonus increase for affordable projects. And that's, uh, those are projects that are 100% affordable. And uh, under this bill, they're allowed to receive up to an 80% density bonus. So that's 30% uh, higher than what's now allowed at 50%. Uh, in addition to that, if these projects that are complying with AB 1763, um, if they're located within a half mile of a major transit stop, then they're also uh, able to receive a three-story height uh, increase or 33 feet uh, for that project uh, to, make that, uh, to make that feasible. And then finally, an especially large piece of legislation is uh, SB 330. And uh, there are several components to this. Uh, the first one being uh, uh, application processing and uh, this, this was really to uh, prevent cities from continuing to move the bar on applicants and, uh, and adding new requirements to an application as they went through the process. So, so this really, so SB 330 really requires cities to have an upfront list of the requirements for an applicant and, uh, and sticking to those through the review uh, and, and not adding additional requirements uh, as the project moves forward. Uh, so that's seen as, uh, you know, some, some kind of streamlining. It also uh, created a, a public meeting cap. So uh, once, project, once a project is deemed complete, there can be no more than five public meetings on that project, and this, this excludes CEQA. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, that would, that would stay at five. 
And then it also did things uh, such as uh, like no down zoning, uh, no moratoriums or, or no new growth control provisions. Um, so SB 330 uh, does not allow that anymore. Um, and then it's also provided direction on uh, not on cities not being able to enforce subjective design standards and really putting forward that cities could only use objective design criteria for reviewing projects. Um, and, I mean, and that's an important reason why the city is, is taking steps in creating those objective design standards to conform to the SB 330 uh, requirements. And then um, finally, uh, there, there's replacement housing provisions. Uh, and before these were really uh, only required for density bonus projects, and now they're required for all for all housing projects. Uh, and this is replacement of uh, affordable housing. And uh, and really during this analysis and, and looking more deeply into density bonus and replacement housing, you know, we really worked through our understanding of these items and. Uh, and staff now thinks uh, there may even be a case where this wasn't applied properly recently as far as replacement housing goes. Uh, so that's definitely something we're looking into and and, uh, and working towards uh, understanding better and ameliorating. So with that, I'll pass that back over to Jess. All right, um, so AB 101, as I'm sure you recall from the staff report, had a, a lot of um, information. In fact, this bill had 57 major provisions pertaining to the 2019 Budget Act. So for anyone who wants to go in depth, I, I highly recommend visiting the California Legislature webpage, uh, leginfo.legislature.ca.gov to go really deep on this. Um, but some of the highlights that were mentioned in the staff report are housing element compliance. So there's a bit of a stick and a carrot um, element here. So there are remedies available to the state for jurisdictions that aren't meeting their housing element requirements, but then there's also incentives and even designations as a pro-housing jurisdiction for those that are meeting certain criteria and have an approved housing element. Um, there's also some information and some uh, rules and definitions about low barrier navigation centers. So the state actually provides a definition of what that is and it allows development by right in certain areas and it also provides deadlines for uh, development. So what the city would be required to do in terms of responding to an application or pre-application. Um, there's some cleanup about uh, SB 35 related to calculations determining um, streamlining approval process and hazardous waste sites. And then there were quite a few funding um, programs and, and changes and updates. So there were two new programs that were um, given one-time grant funding to address homelessness and planning activities. There were some changes to two existing programs, which is Farm Worker Housing Grant and uh, Housing First Parolee Program. And then there were some new funding allocated to four existing housing programs, Cal Home, Local Housing Trust Fund, Low Income Housing Tax Credits, and the Mixed Income Program. So some of these will be familiar to you because we applied for Cal Home earlier this year um, and we didn't get that first round of funding, but we've applied again uh, just a few weeks ago um, and we're hoping to hear back early, early next year. And we're still hoping to hear back on the Local Housing Trust Fund application that we submitted over the summer. Um, so hopefully we'll have some good news on that front um, once we get feedback from the state. Um, so can I have you go? Thanks, Matt. <laughs> All right. Um, so this next slide, there's um, it, it first appearance. It looks like maybe there might be some confusing information with 10% run increase and 5%. So AB 110. Um, pertains to all rentals in California and requires landlords to provide 90 days notice of rent increases above 10% to their tenants. And AB 1482 um, places an upper limit on rent increases for at 5% plus inflation measured through the CPI or 10% 10, 10 whichever is lower. So there's actually some exceptions to this rule. So 1482, so there's some properties that are um, exempted from this requirement. Um, and that includes, you know, projects with uh, deed or agreement restrictions from a government agency, 
or um, projects that have housing subsidies for affordable housing. There's uh, dormitories constructed and maintained for higher education are exempt. Housing that's already subject to rent or price control via public entity. Housing that's received a certificate of occupancy within the last 15 years. Um, rentals not owned by a real estate investment trust or corporation. And um, it's important to keep in mind that, that 1482 is actually going to sunset in 10 years, so in 2030, and it doesn't actually preempt any local rent control laws or just cause ordinances. It just it provides that protection for any properties that aren't exempt for that 10-year period. And then the last one on this slide is uh, SB 18. So this extends um, uh, debt. There was a, an expiration date on providing 90 days notice to tenants who reside in a residence that might be foreclosed upon. So this um, removes that expiration date, which was originally December 31st, 2019, and it's just um, now it's, it's in perpetuity. So any tenant who resides in a residential property, which is sold at a foreclosure sale, is uh, entitled to 90 days notice about that. And then we have one more slide, Matt, thanks. Um, so SB 329, um, this expands California's Fair Employment Housing Act definition of source of income to include uh, lawful verifiable income paid to a housing owner or, or a landlord on behalf of a tenant, and this includes you know, federal, state, or local public assistance. Um, most commonly known of or thought of as Section 8 vouchers, it can also include BASH vouchers and, and all the other public assistance vouchers that we have here in Santa Cruz. And this bill, it does still allow landlords to reject tenancies for other lawful grounds, but they cannot discriminate against a tenant because they are receiving a subsidy payment. All right, thanks. So on, on to 2018 legislation. Uh, the first one we have is AB 2162, which is supportive housing by right. And this was actually something brought to council fairly recently uh, to discuss, because uh, this, this bill allows for a streamlined by right approval process for projects that are affordable, that include supportive services uh, and supportive housing units with them as well. And uh, this bill specifically targets projects that are 50 units or fewer, but also allows cities and jurisdictions to approve uh, projects by right uh, through this bill uh, greater than 50 uh, through a resolution, which council recently passed for three specific projects. And then uh, AB 3194 uh, is related to the Housing Accountability Act. And it, it really just strengthened the Housing Accounting Billy Act further uh, by very, very clearly stating that uh, uh, objective standards in the general plan uh, supersede objective standards or any standards in the zoning code. Uh, so again, it, it really just put forward uh, the, the importance of the general plan and as well as uh, you know consistency between the two. Mm -hmm. And then, oh yeah, we have a few more. Uh, AB 2372 is uh, a density bonus on, uh, what, what it really did was allow for a density bonus to, instead of being taken from a uh, number of units, it could also be taken from floor area ratio of a project. And then AB 2753 was a density bonus uh, streamlining bill. Uh, that really just made, uh, uh, cleaned up a few items to, to make density bonus projects uh, move faster through cities. And then finally, AB 2797 uh, uh, required uh, conformity or consistency between density bonus law and the California Coastal Act, which the, the city has already certified that consistency through a previous amendment that we've worked on. Okay, um, and then the last two bills here to wrap this up. Um, AB 1771 makes uh, multiple changes to requirements for meeting our arena targets 
Um, and a lot of those changes were directed towards uh, Council of Governments, which is, so the state will assign uh, an area, you know, the number of units and the income levels they have to achieve, and then they'll assign it to a Council of Governments, and the Council of Governments will then distribute that throughout their area, their jurisdiction. Um, so a lot of those rules don't directly impact the city, but they kind of indirectly impact the city based on how the Council of Governments has to abide by those rules. Um, some of the, the statutory objectives were revised um, so this, this would be for all cities and jurisdictions. Statutory objectives were revised to include greenhouse gas reduction targets, um, balancing low-wage jobs to housing units affordable to those low-wage workers, and then affirmatively furthering fair housing. And there were some other changes as well. And then SB uh, 765 included some changes to the SB 35, and some of them were requiring recorded agreements for projects and you know, having the detail of that affordability in there. Um, I believe this is also where they got the 55 years of affordability period for rentals and the um, 40 years for the ownership units. Um, we also got clarifications about streamlining parking standards were meant for automobile parking. Um, there were exemptions, CEQA exemptions for certain activities like local government owned land being used for very low, low or moderate income housing. And then they, they clarified that for development uh, that qualifies for streamlining and requires approval under the Subdivision Map Act, um, approvals have to be objective and focused on the compliance with the criteria for streamlined projects. Um, so it, it also requires that the state determines whether a jurisdiction like the city is subject to streamlining based on the last annual progress report that we submit, and they base that looking at the number of building permits that have been issued for very low or low-income households. Great, and with that, staff recommends that council accepts this report, and uh, we're, we're here and happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you for that detailed, comprehensive report over all that legislation. Um, I'll open it up to questions from council members. Uh, council Member Matthews. Thank you. Um, this was a, a good just kind of an inventory of the changes, which is what we asked for. And um, reading through it, it seemed to me, well, I, maybe just for future time, but really understanding which of these um, have already um, shown uh, utilization in Santa Cruz? Which ones we feel are productive? Which ones are problematical? Um, a lot of them are, they're big. Density bonuses, um, ABUs, parking, streamlining, <laughs> inclusionary. I mean, those are all big issues that have been tackled. And, um, Reading through these, I could see some where they'd come up, but um, may, maybe just some comment from staff. Um, I don't want to derail the whole meeting, but, but where, where is the real um, potential and kind of mm, problematic um, just in our community? Because I could, I mean, my gosh, you just look at the um, density bonus where you can get the very low up to three, I think I'm reading it up to three more stories, oh, you know, that, that's going to be controversial. <laughs> so we can, we can predict that. So um, where do we have flexibility? Where do we have potential, um, et cetera? Yeah, thanks for the question. So yeah, these, all of these bills have been approved and, uh, yeah, and, okay. and they're all in, the, and they're all in effect or, or will be in effect. The, the 2020 legislation will go into effect on January 1st. Okay. So for instance, that 50% density bonus law uh, will, will be effective uh, January 1st of 2021. Um, and so yeah, you, you bring up a good point. The, the density bonus projects uh, are, you know, understanding, understanding those as well as the replacement requirements uh, for SB 330 are, are two important pieces of our work. Um, and I would, I would say also, um, 
there, there's other um, other impacts, such as uh, we recently have a, a few churches that are interested in developing housing mm -hmm. on their parking lots. So it was worth mentioning that 50% reduction to them uh, or, or to you uh, in regards to their parking requirements. Um, so we, we are seeing some of these utilized already and, and like the supportive housing uh, has come to council too. Um, so so from, from that end, those, those are some of the more important items uh, in, in figuring out and, and working with. Jess, do you have anything to add? Um, not particularly. Um, I know I don't work on the arena directly, but I know that we've been implementing these changes as they've been coming through in order to stay consistent with the state law. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll add, I'll add, I'll add too, uh, we, you know, we did a lot of work uh, in the last year on ADUs too, and uh, some of that still needs to be accepted by the California Coastal Admission. Um, our commission, so so there is there still is a process involved in, in getting those fully approved for the city and and within our uh, local coastal zone area. So uh, so we are still working on those too, and, and and again, you know, we're always monitoring to see if there's anything else we need to do to conform, and as well as you know, keeping our ear to the ground on future updates to to bring further amendments on those. Uh, 2020 did not have any major ADU changes except the one I mentioned, but the previous two years, uh, the previous three years had a number of them. So we, we also worked quite a bit on that too. And, we, and if, if I could just add, I'd concur with Matt's comments. Um, and um, in response to your inquiry, Councilmember Matthews, I'd also really just wanna, I know Matt mentioned these, but I, I'd wanna stress the, um, the changes and the importance of the changes that came forward as a result of AB 3194 and SB 330. Um, those two bills um, really um, tied local jurisdictions' hands in terms of um, their ability to deny projects. Um, and they also um, substantially increased uh, development capacities on um, on certain sites. So as Matt mentioned, um, the AB 3194 specified that um, the general plan um, objective standards, so essentially the, the dwelling units per acre or the floor area ratio that's permitted by the general plan designation essentially has to be allowed. So even if you have a zoning designation that um, would preclude you from achieving, let's say a zoning, uh, a general plan allows up to 55 dwelling units per acre. But based on your development standards in your zoning ordinance, you really can't feasibly fit the parking, the setbacks, the height regulations and so forth and get 55 dwelling units per acre. Well, that law came along and said, sorry, you have to allow what the general plan allows. And so there are deviations that can happen from the zoning ordinance standards to allow for the capacity that is specified in the general plan. So that was a, a big change um, that um, is you know, not just here, but throughout the state, um, just starting to be seen with, with some of the projects that are coming through. I, I think that was my, my point. We're, we're kind of in the middle of a sea change right now, and these are definitely pro-housing pieces of legislation that have only begun to be felt here, and there's great, great uh, interest and pressure for affordable housing and more housing, and there's, I, I just see a lot of these, we all know, as being wildly unpopular <laughs> among certain parts of the community. So, that's, I think that's more of an observation, but it's definitely a challenge going forward. Sure, I, I would note when you're, when you're referencing the, um, you know, the density bonus, for example, and um, the um, proximity to high quality transit that Matt mentioned, we've um, added a, a layer in our GIS 
that um, shows the half mile proximity to um, transit. And so that um, is available on our website, but it really shows um, the, uh, that a, a big chunk of our city is within that half mile radius and therefore a 100% affordable project could by right get three additional stories or an additional um, 33 feet in height. Um, so, you know, in a single family neighborhood, for example, you could feasibly have a project not at 30 or 35 feet, whatever that height limit is, you know, it could be at 60 feet, for example, in certain areas. Heads up. <laughs> that, would, that would have to be a 100% affordable project to qualify for that, you know, so not every project can happen. Uh, and, you know, there's still various regulations that, that they're gonna have to meet. And I know that some uh, affordable housing developers have looked at smaller sites for that and found that it wasn't feasible. So I don't see that happening. And when that, when that law first came out, I was thinking, wow, affordable housing developers are gonna be snatching up properties and putting in a lot of units. Um, but that really hasn't, we haven't seen that materialize. And in talking with the affordable housing developers, part of that's just an economy of scale in that um, you know, those smaller projects are harder to pencil. And part of it is that they still have to meet certain regulations. You know, you, you're still having to get in certain instances, unless you're providing um, a certain percentage, I think it's 20 or 25% supportive housing, um, you still have parking requirements that are applicable. And so, you know, there, there's still things that the uh, developers and affordable housing developers will need to deal with. But, um, you know, if, some, if a developer comes along and says that uh, they can make that work, we will have very little ability to say no. And, I, and you're right, you know, that could very well be a controversial project if we've got that kind of hype going into an established single family neighborhood, for example. All right, looks like uh, Council Member Byers is up next. Oh, thank you. Um, would you go over the one in school districts that kind of went by me too fast? Whatever that legislation was, I don't have the number. I think that was 3308, yeah. Yes, so right. that that um, bill is, um, it specifically talks about low-income housing tax credits. So it's assuming that a school district project is gonna use those funds in order to develop uh, the, their project. And so what it's saying is that generally you're not allowed to restrict who you rent those units to if you have that oh, funding in your project. But um, the state is making a, a declaration that they're trying to support uh, housing their te teachers and school district employees. So they've, um, by making this declaration, they're essentially allowing school district projects to qualify for both federal and state low-income housing tax credits. If I could, uh, so right now the legislation allows, if a project gets built, only teachers can live there? Or part of the school um, district can live there? Yeah, so it's not that they can only live there, they can be pr pr given a preference. So um, essentially like the first, uh, perhaps the first line you look at for applications is gonna be those teachers and those okay. school district employees. Okay. This bill actually allows um, public employees like city okay. and county employees to also qualify for there. And then um, should the, the school district choose, they could then open it up to the general public. So, so it's a preference working down, okay, thanks a lot. Are there any other questions from council members? I had a couple um, questions. I was just curious. I know that we've been updating, you know, some of our policies as it relates to, to objective design standards. And so I was just curious with all the different bills, are there any other um, like city policies that we'll need to update as a result of some of these changes and as a result of some of those legislation? Yeah, so we're we're certainly coordinating with Kern Planning on on that aspect as well, and making sure we we have all our application process 
processes uh, align with SB 330. Uh, so some of that will be double checking our, our application forms and uh, making sure all the requisite information uh, is contained in each of those and that we're, we're asking for the right things, you know, at, at that very earliest stage in the project because SB 330 really doesn't allow us to ask for them again after that first review. So, so those are the kind of things we're working through, uh, as well as making sure that our, our, uh, you know, currently our density bonus uh, code, like our, our language in our code, references the density bonus. So, uh, we we are good on on that aspect. But other things we need to look at are are things like our replacement requirements uh, in in our code too, and making sure those conform with SB 330. And I was actually going to, my follow-up question was actually to ask if you could elaborate a little bit more on those replacement requirements. Yeah. Well, Matt, so, uh, I, I was just going to add um, that we do have some things, Matt mentioned the density bonus. We haven't um, done updates uh, to align um, some of the density bonus items, um, like the the um, was it 1763 Matt, which is the allow which allows the uh, 100 percent, um, the 80 percent, or unlimited density depending on um, your proximity to transit. That hasn't been added in. Similarly, what came forward this year, uh, AB uh, 2345. Um, that hasn't yet been added um, uh, to our code, um, and we will want to do those cleanups. The, the reason why I wanted to, to be clear about uh, or to, to make that comment is that um, for those items, um, state law will trump our local ordinance. So while we don't have that um, uh, AB 2345, um, we're not going to have that in effect um, to allow a 50% density bonus um, before the January 1st uh, deadline. I think the council members are all, will all recall how we've scrambled to get some of the ADU regulations in place in years past. And part of that was because the ADU regulation specifically said, if any of your code um, is inconsistent with any part of this code, your entire code is null as it relates to ADUs. So we were scrambling to get this forward. It's a little bit different in terms of the density bonus where we're saying, okay, you know, uh, developer, you can use this. We don't have it in our code yet, but you can use it. So I just wanted to, to point that out, that we will have some of those cleanups coming in the future, and um, they, that applicants can still utilize those even though they're not in our local codes. And I'll also mention, too, that SB 330 uh, actually has a, a sunset of uh, 2025 as well. So it was originally put in place for five years. Uh, it, you know, of course, we, we don't know yet whether that will be continued or not. So that's another factor in figuring out how we, we bring that into our, our code. Um, so we're, we're working through that. But as far as, far as the replacement uh, item goes that you mentioned, Justin, uh, or Mayor, that uh, um, the replacement for, uh, for density bonus projects, well, we, we look back through the 2016 and 2014 bills, and those were, those were uh, at that time, that density bonus law went into effect, required replacement of one-to-one -one for uh, affordable units that were, that were being removed for, for a project. So, so that does, um, our, our current code, that doesn't stip, uh, stipulate that exactly. We have different replacement requirements, but they don't say whether it's a density bonus project or not. Um, and if it is a density bonus project, the replacement requirements are actually greater than what our code currently is. So there is some there is some clarification that's needed uh, in that regard. Um, and and those replacement requirements were further. Uh, fleshed out through that SB 330 uh, work where they, they really detailed what those replacement requirements are and uh, we got a better idea of, of how to go forward with applicants and in, in determining that replacement requirement. Great, 
Great, thanks. Thank and then um, I guess the other, I just had one comment, which I know last year there was an item that came before the council and we had a presentation of where we were at in terms of meeting our arena goals. And um, I don't know if we've seen anything this year, but I think it'd be good, you know, at the beginning of next year, if we could just see where we're at, especially given that we're going to have a bunch of affordable projects coming online. And so I'm, I'm sure those will help us meet some of those lower, low and very low income unit arena goals. Yeah, the density bonus projects, um, you know, as, as the council knows, the very low income is the place where we've had the most problems in getting those units. And the density bonus projects um, you know, are coming in and, and typically they're not required to provide very low. They, they have options. They can provide a certain percentage of very low or a certain percentage of low. Um, in the case of ownership, they can also provide a, a certain percentage of um, uh, moderate income. Um, but in general, we're seeing um, most, we're seeing some come in at the low, but most are coming in at the very low to get those additional um, uh, uh, units in the areas where we're having the hardest problem, or biggest challenges um, producing. Um, one thing that I would say to your last question, Mayor Cummings, um, Matt put together a um, analysis of SB 330 that was an attachment. And at the end of that, there is um, some details about replacement housing. And I will say that um, I would encourage you to read that and not the state code, because <laughs> the state code is extremely confusing. Uh, and so um, I, I appreciate the work that Matt put in to try and decipher that. And I think that, that um, while, while that in and of itself isn't um, you know, really simple, it's, it's a thousand times simpler than trying to read the state code. So that's a good resource for you. Great, thanks. Um, are there any other council members who have questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, I'll uh, open it up to members of the public. So if this is an item that you would like to comment on, now's the time to call in using the numbers that are on your screen. Once you've called into the meeting, um, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And uh, while you're in the queue, you'll be asked to unmute your phone once you've been called on and you'll have two minutes. Hey, uh, this is Reggie, can you hear me? Yep, yep, definitely. Hey, um, this was, uh, yeah, this was a really interesting presentation. There's a lot of like projects with like that coming online. Um, I guess one thing I'm wondering about is with the very low income housing, you know, Newsom has this project home key thing where he's like got a ton of money coming in and he's buying uh, motels and hotels that are struggling during COVID. Um, and so they're selling for a very cheap price because they're not allowed to sort of like pivot towards any other use. Um, and there was a UCLA study that uh, sort of inspired this, uh, this project. And so I'm wondering uh, why not sort of take on, because it seems very successful at this point for producing low, very low and no income units, why not sort of like start heading in this direction to meet that demand? Because it really seems like it's the cheapest way we can get a lot of these units very rapidly and not like in a multi-year uh, coming online construction timeline, right, with all those complexities. Like in 2019, there was this uh, motel, 11 units at 123 Bixby Street, and it sold for less than $2 million to market rate housing investors. And so that could have easily been purchased by the city. Um, and now here's where uh, I'm gonna get a little controversial. Uh, if we took, let's say 20% of the police budget uh, and then just put that into a yearly affordable housing budget. Now, the reason I say that is because the police have self-reported that 80% of their time is spent dealing with the houseless. And so it kind of just almost makes a very intuitive amount of sense that we would take some of their funding and just completely try to address this issue at the root. 20% um, would be about $6 million <laughs> by uh, motels like this and other multifamily homes. So uh, just wondering your thoughts on that, thank you.
Thank you for your comments. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to council um, for any further comments. I do have a question, and maybe uh, I can direct this to uh, planning or maybe to the city manager. I'm just curious, you know, based on the comments we just heard, if um, there's been any hotels that have um, approached the city in terms of um, you know, wanting to sell their properties under this project home key, or if there's been any discussion with folks at the county level around purchasing hotels or motels? Oh, well, I guess I'll start and then see if the, the staff have addition, additional information to provide. Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, direct contact with any hotelier or property owner with interest in selling the property to the city. Uh, I think early on they were, they were interested in participating in, in, uh, in the rental uh, or the use for uh, uh, for homeless the, to stay, but not necessarily to sell, but only to uh, to lease is, is, is what I uh, the information I have. I don't know if uh, Lee, do you have any more, or Bonnie, if you've got any more information from the yeah, I just to what you're saying, um, city manager. Um, early on, when hotels were completely closed, there was quite a bit of interest in. Um, be collaborating um, with the project to be able to provide um, lodging. However, now that hotels can open again, we, you know, and there is occupancy, we, we've seen that change. So when there was complete closure, there was a lot of support. I'm not aware of any hotels particularly. I do think um, that possibly Susie or Paul um, were engaging directly with some of the hotels in the program at the state level. They may have a little additional information, but probably weren't expecting that to come up today, so I'm not sure if, if they're available. Okay. We can follow up. Okay. Uh, Council Member Byers. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to the, the person who just spoke to us, um, I just want to reaffirm that all the research over and over has been telling us you have to house people to solve the problem. So I just want to agree with him. We And maybe look at some of those motels, how about 10-year leasing? Um, they just may be interested. I think we ought to be approaching them uh, affirmatively way, rather than waiting for them to come to us. So it, it's just, it's, it's so true. We've got to get them off the street. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any further comments from council members? Okay, seeing none, um, I don't know if we need a motion uh, on this item, but uh, council member Matthews. Oh, you're muted. I do appreciate having all this information, which has a huge amount of content and implications to it. Uh, appreciate having it brought together in one report. So I'll move that we accept the um, the update and agenda report. I'll second that. Uh, so we have a motion to uh, accept the update and the report from staff. Uh, motion was made by Council Member Matthews, seconded by Mayor Cummings. Uh, if there's no further questions or comments, we'll, why don't we go ahead and take the roll call vote on the item. Mm -hmm. Council Member Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder is absent. Um, Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers is absent and Mayor Cummings? Aye. So that passes with Council Members Brown, Watkins, Matthews, Byers, Mayor Cummings voting in favor with Council Member Golder and Vice President absent. Um, why don't we, before we move to the next item, why don't we take a quick, maybe 10 minute break um, and we'll come back and uh, move on to the next item. All right, once everyone's back, if you can turn your uh, video cameras on, we can go ahead and move on to the next item. All right, 
So the next item up on our agenda is item number two, the general business, the housing blueprint subcommittee uh, recommendations and update. And so I'll turn it over to our planning director, Lee Butler, principal planner, Matt Van Waugh, and and management anim analyst, Jessica Malor. Uh, Councilmember Matthews, let's see your hands up. Um, I'm just gonna put my face up, but I'm here and I'm listening. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Hello again, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council. Uh, so let me share my screen here. And uh, joining me in this presentation is uh, uh, Economic Development Director uh, Bonnie Lipscomb as well. And there's a number of slides where we'll kind of be jumping back and forth between the two of us uh, on them. So with that, uh, this is the, the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee Recommendations Report. Uh, and just really an update on where we're at with that. Um, as far as the background goes, in 2017, there was about six months of outreach spent on creating the Voices on Housing Community Report. And that was eventually uh, uh, reported to council, uh, presented to council in December of 2017. And at that meeting, it was decided that the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee would be formed. And uh, there, once that was formed, there was a lot of outreach and a lot of community outreach. And the subcommittee made initial recommendations uh, for the Housing Blueprint uh, on in March of 2018. There was further community outreach. And then on June 12, 2018, the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee submitted recommendations that were accepted to council. And I really wanna stress this was, this was an award-winning uh, process. Uh, this outreach and the documents produced by it, uh, they received uh, awards uh, for the American Planning Association, both regionally for Northern California, as well as uh, a statewide award of merit in 2019. And so the, the recommendations in this report really follow three, three categories. Uh, one is community vitality, the next is housing protection, and then finally housing production. And housing production uh, has, has a, a large majority of the items that we identified. And uh, staff went through the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee re recommendations report and created a matrix of 57 actionable items uh, for us to track and follow and follow the, uh, the, the completion of. And uh, of those 57 actionable items, uh, staff determined that 37 of those were completed, uh, 17 were underway, and three have not yet been started. So, so really in addition to this being an award-winning outreach process, it's also been a, a very successful process uh, in, in completing a lot of these items and moving forward a lot of important housing initiatives in the city. And so I'll start by going through some of the highlights of those items and uh, talking more about them. And so community engagement, this is under the community vitality category. Um, and I'll, and my, my first one here is that planning uh, created the community engagement policy um, in 2018, and it was since amended in 2019. Um, so that was something that, uh, that the planning and uh, uh, community development department took on uh, through this recommendation and, uh, and created, and we've been using since, which has been successful in, uh, in outreach and transparency. Uh, for projects, and I'll hand it off to Bonnie here for the next ones. Thanks, Matt. Um, so as far as the state of affordable housing updates, and actually the next couple ones, we've taken sort of a holistic view towards this. We obviously, as part of our mid-year and our annual budget, include some comprehensive information about um, our affordable housing, both in creation, um, funding that we've gone uh, towards supportive projects, as well as uh, current status on our affordable housing trust fund and other funding sources um, for the creation of affordable housing. 
Um, as far as our housing speaker and engagement series, we did kick that off last year with our Housing 101 course. Um, we have put the in, obviously the in-person uh, meetings, and that was a, I should back up and say that was a collaboration with National Development Council. Development we have Council. the in-person meetings on hold for right now, so we are looking at Zoom opportunities. Uh, we are hoping maybe to re-engage um, next spring and in-person, but we'll, we'll, we'll see on that. We're looking at uh, taking some of these classes online, and um, National Development Council has been developing online platform for those. So we're looking at opportunities. The specific class that we had with National Development Council was developed specifically for Santa Cruz using Santa Cruz model, local real estate information. And so that was a special class just for us. So we would look at potentially providing that class again, having more in-depth um, at home, uh, Excel, Performa analysis, and uh, kind of building from there. Um, as far as the ha Affordable Housing Academy, we piloted that somewhat through the Citizens Academy that Parks and Rec kicked off last year. And in, in uh, conjunction and collaboration with planning, we did sort of have a, a Housing 101 and a downtown walking tour of affordable housing projects that was a, a really sort of fun and interactive um, evening that we had. So we look forward to doing that again and expanding that into a larger program in the future. And then uh, one of the requests that, that we had that we've really uh, taken to heart, and it is now on our Choose Santa Cruz under the housing division, is the um, interactive affordability map that's on our website. And Matt, if you could advance that, there you go. Um, and as you can see, you can click on each one of these red houses represents a multifamily project over 10 units. And so you can click on that. This one, for example, we clicked on Jesse Street, shows you the project type, um, how many total units are in the project, typically number of affordable units because they usually have one manager's unit, um, and then the major funding source um, for a project. So this, you can click on that for any of the projects over unit size 10 affordable housing projects and get this information, which is really great. Um, next slide. And back to you, Matt. All right. Yep. So as I mentioned a little bit in the, the legislation update prior to this, uh, this presentation, uh, there's really a number of, uh, of ADU uh, recommendations uh, in, the, in the housing blueprint recommendations as well. And, uh, and a lot of those were, were done also through uh, conforming with state law as well. So, so those changes, uh, they were brought to council in just on December 10th, 2019. And again, those, those included things like modifying rear yard uh, lot coverage requirements, allowing junior ADUs and ADUs, uh, modifying size of attached ADUs, and then also uh, no replacement parking for garage conversion ADUs and things like that. Um, and a lot of these ADU changes really went, uh, went towards uh, uh, the legalization of unpermitted units, which is under our housing, protect, uh, housing protection category. And uh, in, in, in making these changes, it really removed some of the barriers to uh, the legalization of these unpermitted units, which was one of those uh, you know, key tasks in, in that housing protection category. By the, by the subcommittee recommendations. And uh, staff, staff has deemed that uh, complete, but still will continue to evaluate you know, any other barriers to legalization of, of unpermitted units. And then as far as a variety of housing types go, uh, junior ADUs were included in that, which, which staff has completed. Um, and something on our on our work plan going uh, in in the very near future is to work on uh, single room occupancy SRO and uh, small ownership SOU units. So we'll be we'll be bringing those forward as uh, as possible changes in in the future. And then as far as uh, affordability and inclusionary, now we're kind of into housing production. Uh, fully uh, as far as the categories go. And one of those was affordability and inclusionary and something planning worked on quite a bit was the large rent increase. Uh, planning went to uh, four separate council meetings in uh, 2017, uh, three in 2017 and one in 2019. Um, 
and really continues to provide, uh, you know, landlords and tenants calling for information on this ordinance. And uh, what, what really came out of that was the large rent increase, which, uh, you know, defines the, the rent can increase of 5% or more in one year, 7% over two years. And then uh, the next one is on the transit occupancy tax. And um, this is a funding source that we were, uh, that was under discussion with the Revenue Council Subcommittee. And we did look at that. We had a series of meetings over the last year with the hotel, uh, with the hotel community um, and industry. And we're moving, you know, having some really in-depth conversations about what could be supported. And definitely affordable housing creation was an area where uh, there was quite a bit of support um, from the lodging industry, particularly with the recognition that many of their employees can't afford to live in the Santa Cruz community and do commute. So there was support for this discussion. However, under the context of the pandemic, um, we did make a, uh, you know, both internal and in, in consultation with council members sort of policy decision to put this on hold for now um, while our local businesses and hospitality industry recover from the impacts of the pandemic, of course, which we're uh, all and which they're all still feeling. So that is an avenue that we were pursuing um, at the appropriate time. You know, we'll, we'll sit back down and, and, and really look into that again. As I said, there was support for that specifically for the purpose of affordable housing creation. And then on the update of the inclusionary requirements, we've done quite a bit of work on this. Um, you know, last year we did have the approval to take uh, inclusionary to 20%. Um, we did make that change in the ordinance and we've been working with the planning commission and recently had approval of a specific um, flexibility around section eight for a portion of that 20%. And that will be coming to council um, to you for consideration to be included in the inclusionary ordinance. Uh, that proposed language on November 24th. Um, related to that, we have two other areas related to inclusionary requirements. One is some cleanup language uh, related to the settlement of the lawsuit on the Pacific Front Laurel Project related to our inclusionary ordinance and cleanup items that's coming forward, as well as uh, so, uh, an area that there was quite a bit of interest at the council and the community level um, through some, some of the outreach that we did through the housing blueprint work around coming up with a meaningful workforce housing definition. One of the things that we're looking at right now in the work that we've been doing with the planning subcommittee um, has been looking at employer-sponsored uh, workforce housing as a pilot. We have a couple of projects, at least one specifically we've already referenced today in the school district. If we could find a meaningful uh, definition that actually would work going forward as we really look at um, uh, the what would be required for that definition of uh, rent that would qualify for workforce housing, that definition. So that um, will be a really good discussion at the upcoming planning commission, November 17th. And um, our goal is to bring both of those back to you for consideration um, at the first meeting in January. But the first will be the specific sec section eight language that's coming to you on November 24th. Thanks. And uh, next in the recommendations, uh, we have a, a list of uh, parking policy uh, recommendations, and uh, all of those were uh, all of the parking reduction items were completed. In fact, uh, staff just went to council a few weeks ago on the October 13th to bring forward uh, the, the remaining items in this parking reductions category. Uh, as far as in lieu parking fees. Uh, the, the report recommended that uh, we create a, a policy for in-lieu parking fees for specific developments outside of downtown if, if they're within uh, a quarter mile of an alternative parking facility. And that's something that staff hasn't completed. We've been working on that, working on that at, in calculating that as a, on a project to project basis, uh, but we don't have a specific policy developed yet. And then uh, we've done a number of, uh, of the downtown parking updates as well uh, last year. And uh, those included things like offsite parking allowance as well as in lieu fee updates and uh, tiering of those in lieu fees for affordable housing. Um, and then a, an additional one we haven't finished yet is the uh, off-peak residential parking permit program. 
and that, that's really just because uh, there's currently not technology available to, to implement, implement that project, and uh, and it would be a, a significant CIP expense to put that in. So we're we're still looking forward to uh, doing that at some point if, if it can fit into the CIP, then that would move forward. So for uh, for density bonus, as I mentioned, a, a, a number of changes were adopted through the years, uh, including that in August 2018, we we did a number of density bonus changes that involved uh, the tiering system, uh, minimum square foot modifications for uh, uh, for density bonus affordable units, uh, defining the transit stop to be consistent with state law, and then also allowing housing choice and Section 8 vouchers uh, for the affordable density units created. So those were a number of, of uh, recommendations in the subcommittee report uh, related to density bonus that uh, that staff completed. Uh, and then it also recommended, you know, continuing to look for ways to expand the density bonus and to update it. And uh, certainly that that's all been taken care of at this point by conforming with state law given given how much density bonus uh, density bonus bills have passed recently and have increased and expanded uh, the role of density bonus in our work, uh, such as the, the projects or the, the bills that we mentioned previously, AB 2345, the moving to a 50% density bonus uh, for projects, and then that AB 1763, which was the 80% density bonus for 100% affordable projects. So those, those are two uh, that are we're certainly incorporating into the density bonus work that we do and we'll continue looking for other expansion and updates on those. And then finally, another, another item that was mentioned uh, in, the, in the recommendations report was, was looking at Ocean Street uh, zoning district and, uh, and really effectuating that as an area plan. And uh, you know, that was something that uh, was, was really included into the, the corridors effort. And uh, since that failed, staff has applied for and received uh, SB2 grant for doing the objective standards. And uh, we really feel like uh, this is an important next step in that work in, into completing that objective in this report. Um, it really brings the city in line with many requirements under SB 330 and it also provides a lot of direction on residential and mixed use development, which is a you know important step in, in aligning the, the zoning code and the general plan uh, objective standards. And then uh, in terms of uh, downtown housing creation, uh, just a few things. Uh, one is that, uh, again, I mentioned a lot of the parking updates that were done, those those overlapped with downtown housing creation. Uh, so we completed that item through our previous parking updates. And then in terms of uh, enabling new projects, there, there's a number of projects that have come on board in the past few years, whether it's Pacific Front and Laurel Project, uh, which is expected in 2021, uh, as well as a few others, 175 unit project on Front Street, which is uh, seeking council approval next week. And then there's actually another 170 unit project currently under review by planning. And uh, under this as well, it, it's, it's also important to mention that uh, planning actually just, just last week already received approval from AMBEG of our, uh, of our REAP grant which is a $300,000 grant that's going to go towards uh, the project to explore down, uh, the expansion of the downtown plan boundaries. So with, with that funding approved, we're gonna be starting that project in the near future to explore that downtown plan expansion and uh, potentially allow for a number of new sites in the downtown area uh, for housing and mixed use development. And I would just add to that as far as enabling new projects, one thing that is actually um, related to a couple of different items earlier in the housing blueprint uh, recommendations it are really looking closely at specifically at our fee waivers, um, which is part of our inclusionary ordinance. And as part of enabling new projects, we really
really want to be able to provide some greater certainty to developers that are building affordable housing in the community around what their fee, uh, fee and fee schedule will look like. So that's something even just this morning, we internally had a meeting across departments um, about the fee schedule, recognizing there's a number of projects that will be coming uh, before you um, in the next few months, and a number of them uh, will have, will either be 100% affordable or contain a certain amount of affordable housing, and we'll be looking at some assistance as far as the city fees that are charged. So specifically, um, we have been, as uh, a project on Coral Street will be one, um, the Calvary Church potentially is another one, and then the city uh, uh, site owned project um, on Metro, which I'll show you, talk about in just a minute, would be another one. So it's really important that we feel to look at this part of our inclusionary ordinance as well and being able to provide some certainty around uh, fees for developers around affordable housing creation. Um, as part of the housing blueprint recommendations, um, we were asked and directed to uh, really look at the city-owned parcels. We did present that to council uh, the previous year. I will say that uh, part of the two overwhelming directions from that and opportunities um, would be either the sale of the city-owned Sky Park property either um, or something creative with the city of Scotts Valley to enable affordable housing creation. So that's one thing that we have been looking at. Um, and the other one um, would be the consolidation that Matt's already referred to earlier of some of the city-owned sites that are parking to look at those for the possibility of mixed-use projects. And obviously the library uh, project is a good example of that one. And I'll just show a couple of slides about a couple of those projects currently. So the first one, this first one actually is, was recently completed last year, and um, this is a great project, and this was funded with $4.7 million of city funding, including former RDA and Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Um, this is the 41-unit uh, Water Street Apartments um, on Water Street. Uh, next slide. And this is the Pacific Station project. This is just conceptual rendering at this point. This is actually the uh, sort of connection. The uh, uh, graphic on the far left is uh, an early version, it's dated now, of the public paseo that connects um, through, as, as really called out in the downtown plan, the, that sort of visionary piece of making those connection points from the downtown um, through uh, Pacific and Front, connecting to the Riverwalk. And so this is a rendering of what that could be, and this also is sort of a bridge that connects PAC Station North to PAC Station South. We originally hadn't envisioned this as two separate projects, but it really is, is working out that way. Um, through land dedication and the city acquisition, which you approved over the summer, uh, we've been able to assemble the land south of the Metro Center and have been moving forward on an 85-unit, 100% affordable housing project in conjunction with Santa Cruz Community Health Center and uh, Dentist, and for, so providing both uh, low-cost medical and dental care for the Santa Cruz community. And Matt, if you go to the next slide, um, you can see, and you, you've seen this recently this summer, but this is uh, just to really show again the progression also of that. You can see that public paseo uh, connectivity point from Pacific um, Avenue all the way through to the Riverwalk, as well as really how engaged and active we can have an affordable housing project be in our downtown core by having some commercial retail facing Pacific Avenue frontage with uh, Santa Cruz Community Health Center and Deantis on the second floor, and then above that is our housing, our 85 units. Um, we are uh, waiting uh, we, just day by day now to hear on uh, the funding um, for this project. We do have funding secured for it, but we additionally applied for a pre-sizable grant um, funding, which we're in the final round on. Next slide. This is PAC Station South, and this is just to show the area um, that's under discussion right now. So the uh, area that I just showed you um, specifically is the blue, the lower, the blue three parcels and the yellow parcels. Together, that makes the PAC Station South. All the properties above that, shaded in blue, where it says city-owned properties and metro-owned properties, is where PAC Station North will be. And that will be between a 50 and 100-unit project what we're looking to do is have change that either do a transfer or joint use development where the city develops the 75 feet um, depth along Pacific Avenue and the Metro uh, will have a new bus transfer center on the back. And you can see what this looks like in a very conceptual rendering in the bottom right photo. 
where you can see the Metro New Transit Center in the back. That one just has sort of a cover over it and uh, the new development by the city on the front. So this is an exciting project. We are um, hoping to make uh, the next round in affordable housing sustainable community grant funding, um, ASIC funding, and we've been working with Metro um, to, meet, to meet this really tight timeline and um, seeing if we can really get, get the project specifics together to make that happen. And to that end, we did release um, earlier this month an RFP. We've already issued the first RFI a request for information response to developers. There's a very robust interest in being the developer partner um, at, at a minimum for the affordable housing, um, affordable housing component potentially for the whole project. So we're looking at that right now. We're hoping to be able to be in a position to make a decision and move that forward before the end of this calendar year. Thanks, next slide. And uh, the other project recently before you as well is a library mixed use project. At a minimum, this will include 50 units of affordable housing. Um, at our last council meeting, we went over the financing specifically for the affordable housing component of this project. I will mention that since we came to council, we have formally been awarded uh, the 1.5 million from the uh, permanent local housing um, allocation. And we've received we, the the uh, standard agreement for the first year of that funding. It's spread out over five years. And we have recommended that the first three years of that funding be dedicated to the affordable housing component of this project. So um, this is just another project um, that we're pretty excited about to move forward on the affordable housing creation in the downtown. Thanks, next slide. All right, uh, so for some additional housing items uh, in the recommendations report, uh, the child care impact fee is something planning worked on extensively in uh, 2019 to develop a plan for. Uh, and that, that plan development was, uh, was presented to council on December 10th, 2019. And uh, subsequently have been working for, have been working towards an implementation resolution for that. And uh, staff is working on that currently and is expecting to present that implementation resolution to council, uh, coupled with the public safety impact fee uh, in early 2021. And then in terms of the housing legislative, legislative program, uh, it was recommended that we provide updates on housing legislation to council last year in, in 2019. Uh, we provided council with a, a League of California Cities webinar on the 2019 legislation update. And uh, th this year, uh, just prior to this presentation, we, we provided a significant update on, uh, on the legislation, a uh, more comprehensive update from 2018 to 2020 for council uh, to, meet, to meet that recommendation as well. And on the, regarding the budget considerations for tenant resources, we have uh, made quite a bit of, uh, of ground on this one. And Matt, if you could ad advance the slide. We put together just sort of a brief overview um, of the, we do have a variety of funding sources that go towards tenant, uh, tenant assistance and tenant resources. I will additionally say that on our city, uh, Choose Santa Cruz site, if you go to our housing, Subpage and click on tenant resources. We have additional resources, including contact information for a lot of our partners, including Tenant Sanctuary, um, uh, CRLA for existing and current um, programs to provide uh, ten tenant uh, legal assistance. So we have those programs as well. But just quickly, a recap on the overview. We have quite a few funding sources that are going to Community Action Board. Um, we had the opportunity this year through additional round funding of CARES Act to provide an additional uh, 30,000 to CAB on emergency eviction prevention program. So we're across CDBG, our special cares at Red Cross and Home, we're providing about 240,000 a year uh, for eviction prevention program to uh, community action board. And then additionally 136,000 to the housing authority for our um, security deposit program. And then um, this year additionally, we provided 30,000 of CDBG funds for tenant counseling through California rural legal assistance, and then through the core program out of the city manager's office, additional
additionally, um, the city's providing um, 30000 for tenant legal services and additional CAB funding um, since 2017, at least, over the last three years um, of 30000 a year. So we do have quite a few different funding sources that are going towards tenant resources. And you can see an overview of these um, on the housing resources page that I mentioned. Thanks, Matt. Great, and then uh, one final slide. We just wanted to leave council with uh, a, a few especially important work items that we're, that we're working on moving forward in, in 2021, especially. Uh, so for planning, uh, we've, we've actually kicked off our objective standards work and have, have been working on that since September uh, when, when, that was, when the scope was formally approved and we brought our consultant in and we've since been having meetings with them. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to presenting some of our initial results on those meetings to Planning Commission in December uh, and following that uh, to City Council in early 2021. And then something we're also going to be working on soon is the housing element update. Planning uh, is expected to receive uh, grant funding for that as well through the LEAP grant. So we have $300,000 uh, available to work on the housing element update, which which for the city of Santa Cruz is due by 2023. So at, at some point in 2021, we'll be starting to work on that, uh, especially once we get our, our regional housing allocation needs, uh, the arena uh, numbers in from the state. And then finally, uh, the downtown plan expansion project, which I mentioned previously, that, that grant was actually already approved by AMBEG. Who is, who is overseeing that grant. And so that's something uh, we do plan on getting started to work on soon. And, and this was just presented to council uh, on October 13th as well, where we, uh, we do anticipate coming back to council once we have more information uh, and, and a plan for community outreach so we can receive further direction from council on that aspect. And um, obviously on the Metro and the Library project, I just went over those. I will add that we will be coming forward to council and doing uh, considerable community outreach, um, both once for approval of development partners, as well as uh, further refinement of the funding source, applying for related grant funds, and then bringing conceptual designs um, forward to you for consideration. And then uh, through the regular budget process, um, we will continue to work on tenant assistance and additional resources. And I, I would add to that that we're in regular communication, both with CAB and the Housing Authority, about their needs and sort of monitoring where they are in, in expending the city funds and whether or not they need additional funding um, throughout the course of the year. So we have um, we, we look at that pretty closely. Thank you. Great, and with that, uh, staff recommends that council accepts this report, and uh, we're here for any questions you have. Thank you. All right, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, I'll go ahead and open up to council members if anybody has questions, and we'll start with council member Matthews. Thank you. That was really an incredible report. And looking over this, um, I was just so struck by how much has been achieved in basically three years. The, the housing um, blueprint endeavor was very ambitious, occupied a full year. And I was just so impressed looking at, you know, in the day to day and the week to week, we think, oh, the problems are vast and what progress are we making? But to see it compiled here, there's so much that has been achieved and is in the works to say, 57 actionable items, 37 have been completed, 17 more are underway. That's incredible in three years And when you think of the complexity of these projects. So just congratulations. I know Council Member Brown was on that committee, Cynthia Chase, and who else was on that one? I can't remember. Martine, were you on it? Yeah, well, good work. I mean, it's satisfying to see those recommendations having gone through so much outreach and chewing on by the staff and council to, to see the progress is really impressive. So, good. Um, quick question, Bonnie, on AB 411, trying to retrieve that redevelopment money. <laughs> what happens to that? Is it going to sit there forever? Uh, yeah, that's a sad, sad state. Um, 
We all have, even though we were able to get through both uh, houses, uh, you know, both both the House and the Senate at the state level, um, politically with the Department of Finance, uh, there we just couldn't get over that hurdle. The Department of Finance came out against it. They want that funding to stay in the state coffers. Um, you know, we were successful. We, we have um, allocated and we're able to keep 100 percent of the little over $7 million in affordable housing bonds as part of that larger $35 million bond issue. Um, it, and we were able to rent, retain 35 percent, you know this, um, but 35 percent of the capital bonds. So we were really going to bat trying to get that remaining, you know, $16 million um, that was frozen um, for affordable housing. We thought we had a really good chance at it, had a lot of support. But ultimately, I think the precedent that that would set for some of the other remaining agencies out there, some of which were in lawsuits with the state, I think was too much for uh, the governor with the Department of Finance um, recommending against it. So it is sitting there. Um, we have uh, next year, we potentially do have to defeat those. We're still looking for other opportunities, but we, in uh, meeting with, um, uh, actually meeting with Mark Stone, um, just with the political climate, we, we haven't pursued picking that back up in the current year. However, if, if there's some champions out there, you know, it's definitely a worthy cause. Um, and Councilmember Brown has been a real supporting, uh, supporting force and advocate for that. So if there is desire, we're willing to go to Sacramento again and, and make another run at it. But the, the last feedback we had from the governor's office and from uh, Mark Stone's office was that we would likely probably not be successful. Well, I mean, Painful. Me, it, just, it just seems obscene. I don't know any other word for it. Um, yeah. And, you know, John Laird is heading to Sacramento, so, um, and the need for affordable housing does not get wet. So, anyway, I had to ask yeah. that question. This, um, would be, this would be our last attempt if we wanted to do something, uh, yeah, once John, John Laird is now going into office, this would be our last opportunity. So it is worth pursuing if we can get some support. And then just a final question. So if that doesn't work, does the state just keep our $16 million? million? Is that? No, basically <laughs> part of how that would work is we they would want us to use it for our outstanding debt to pay off the remaining. So, for example, we have uh, uh, agreed um, agreements in place for 1010 Pacific and Schaefer Road. Yes. Yeah. So you know, 40% affordable housing projects that go to the end of the life of the redevelopment agency, which is 2033, 3233. And so basically they would have us use this outstanding uh, mm -hmm. funding to pay off that debt so that all the new tax increment coming in between now and 2033 would go straight into the state. You know, they could use it for what, what they want to use it for. Okay, well, anyway, thank you. Um, a couple other quick things. What is the just general timeline for the objective standards? I guess this is the lead question. Just general. Yeah, I can or, I can answer that. Um, yeah, that uh, it's expected to be a 15 month process and started okay. in September. So we're looking at completing it by the end of 2021. Okay. Um, I had a question on the. Um, grant uh, for expansion of the downtown area, um, which I fully support looking at that. A couple of points there. Um, you know, I, I hope whatever work program that encompasses is not simply a matter of height and design and so forth, but also vision for downtown. I've mentioned previously, um, you know, there was a hope that the Puma project could tackle that. We're all so aware of how downtowns are changing all over the country. Um, and this it, it seems an opportune time to, if at all possible, um, think a little bit more than simply boundaries and assessments. So I wonder if there's any comment on that, maybe from Bonnie or planning, I don't know. Or not. <laughs> Maybe that's just my opinion throwing out. <laughs> sure. Thank you for that comment. And I think it's a, a very timely one in that, you know, when we go out to the community, we'll, as mentioned at the last meeting, you know, we're going to be presenting our outreach strategy to the council in advance of, um, of 
going and doing any outreach to identify what those boundaries will be. And as part of that, we will certainly be thinking bigger picture in terms of you know, those boundaries are not only going to set um, what uh, the downtown plan expansion is going to be, but it's also going to really shape what the future of our downtown is. Like, you know, people have different ideas in their mind about um, what our downtown is. And um, that is changing as new projects come in and it will continue to change. You know, many people think, you know, when, when you think about downtown Santa Cruz, you think Pacific Avenue. Um, but as we start getting additional projects on um, Front Street, for example, and engaging the river, then we're gonna have, you know, people's mind's eye is gonna drift to, oh, well, downtown is also the um, interface on the river there and the restaurants that look out on the river. And we're gonna have this opportunity to um, have areas in the south of downtown, what is now considered downtown, you know, south of Laurel, also have um, that sort of iconic um, uh, visualization for um, what downtown could be. And the Warrior Stadium, um, I think, can be a, a big component of that in terms of a draw that people think of. And um, because so many people will be drawn to that area, really thinking about what the vision for that area is is gonna be crucial to understand, all right, how are we gonna make this an extension of our downtown, something that represents Santa Cruz well, something that people think about and are drawn to because of the quality of the architecture, the quality of the built environment, the pedestrian interface, the connections to the river, all those things are gonna to need to be considered. And you're absolutely right, the, the vision is gonna to need to really lead the way before we dive in to, okay, if we've got this vision, what are, the, what are the components of that in terms of development standards, in terms of height, in terms of um, street interface, in terms of required um, retail at the ground level and the, the heights of those first floors, all of that's gonna be a uh, component, but um, setting that vision first is gonna be important. Great, and you know, I'm sure you know, I mean, there's so much exciting work going on regionally in this whole field, all the, the spur activities up in the Bay Area. There's just, there's so much to draw on that it, it seems like a, a real opportunity to, oh, I just saw the Steve Jobs movie, Think Different. <laughs> um, and finally, you know, in all this downtown stuff, um, I supported all the parking changes, et cetera. Um, but I, I do see a tendency to uh, always shift the parking requirements somewhere else to the point they're not ending up anywhere. And realistically, that's a component that does have to be dealt with downtown. The um, um, developer of the new Calvary project has been pretty, who also did the 1010 Pacific has been very explicit. Um, even if you shift the parking somewhere else or reduce the requirements, it has to be realistically figured into the, um, the overall equation. And certainly that southern part of downtown, um, you feel that need um, more acutely as density increases. That's it. Yeah, thanks, thanks for your comments on the, on the parking as well. And uh, just, just to follow up on that, uh, it, it, parking is something like we'll likely study more through our objective mm -hmm. standards process in some fashion. Um, and then as well, we, we had mentioned uh, in the when the previous parking amendments went forward uh, a few months ago, uh, we had mentioned a few other items such as uh, looking into, uh, you know, geographically based parking zones mm -hmm. and things like that too, for how parking reductions are, are created through the city. So th those are things on our mind we'll continue to think about going forward in terms of parking. Yeah. Okay, uh, next up we have Council Member Watkins followed by Council Member Brown. Yeah, I'll just echo um, 
Councilmember Matthews' appreciation and gratitude for the presentation and all the work that went into creating the, um, the subcommittee's recommendations and then moving forward and hearing from the community. And I know at one point we really talked about um, monitoring the progress, but also sort of just revisiting at a future time, kind of a, a, a reiteration of this as we move forward and continuing to try to get the community's input in designing housing solutions. So um, definitely something to think about moving forward. I just have one, um, actually I have two brief questions. One is in regards to all of the funding that was referenced um, to support tenants r right now. It, has that been, is that still adequate for the need that you're, that you're seeing or where are we at based on kind of all of the different kind of con considerations for people with, with the economy and such? Yeah, that, um, and thank you for asking that question, um, Council Member Watkins, and that is something that we're, we're working closely with our partner agencies on, and to date, um, they have not expended the funds. They're on track for, for the year. Um, so, um, you know, we'll, we'll continue to look closely at that. When we looked actually at the newest round of CARES funding, we specifically looked at um, those that have been recipients and the additional funding that we gave them specifically around tenant resources. And they were still in the process, although there is some lag time for invoicing, um, but they were still in the process of, of using their regular funding. So it looks like at least right now from what's been submitted to us that we're on track for the year but it is something that we revisit regularly, particularly in light of the additional CARES funding and the need that's out there. One of the things that we have found around um, the CARES funding and sort of the outreach to our partner agencies, because we did you know, provide some CARES funding to CAB for this program, was that it, the um, food, those that are providing food, food banks, um, Meals on Wheels um, through Community Bridges, um, actually the Second Harvest Food Bank and uh, the Farmers Market have all been um, organizations that have, you know, if, if either already spent all their funding or on track to have spent all their funding that we're really looking at through the CARES has that really big need right now. So we're looking at that closely as well. But as far as the tenant resources, we seem to be um, appropriately funded at least at this point in time. Great. And maybe I um, actually have, I have three brief questions, but while you're on, Bonnie, you, you mentioned that this would be the time if we were wanting to go to the state to try to pursue getting that funding. How, what is the timeline that you think would be appropriate if there was sort of our local efforts to, to get some of the, the funding that's being held up there? You're talking about our bond funding, our frozen Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think we'd probably, the first thing we'd wanna do is set up um, set up a meeting with our you know representatives and okay. just, and, and see where they are because it is something, this is the year where we could defease or where we're sort of obligated to fees. We had a no kick out clause um, in, in 2021. So this is really, it's something that we need to hit the ground running on if we're gonna make one more round at this and see if we can get political support to take this through, both um, through the legislation again, which we were successful the first time, but we really need the governor's office and DOF, Department of Finance, that's a tough one. So if we can get support um, from John Laird's office, I think maybe that that would be the route to go. But that's something we should move on pretty quickly. Great. Yeah, well, you can definitely keep us posted on how to sort of support that. Um, and then I guess my last sort of question and I guess like comments are, you know, in regards to the child care developer fee, you know, with all of the development coming on downtown, having more childcare facilities available will be really essential. And I also know that we have vacant um, spaces. And so even if some of those fee fund funds could be put into supporting, you know, existing structures, you know, to become, um, you know, state, uh, you know, adhering to the state standards around childcare facilities, it'd be, it's, it's really critical that we're thinking that way. And I, so if, if the fee goes into place, then it won't necessarily be applied retroactively to any, any um, uh, proposed uh, development. So it would only be moving forward. So that's sort of my question part of it. I'm gonna defer to you on that one. But uh, actually, Lee, before you're muted, but before you speak, I did want to mention that um, on the PAC Station South project, we actually have been working with a selected developer to see if it's possible to include daycare facilities, childcare within the project. So we've been looking at that. We have a preliminary site plan for having that in there, and we're now looking at the state requirements to see if it meets the adequate 
um, requirements, both on size um, and accessibility, that we would need as well as the public open space component. So we're looking at that. We're trying to see if there's a way we can do that, and then if we can get it funded through additional grant funds. So we are we do recognize that, and we have heard heard you um, in saying that that that's a need, and we recognize it's a need. So we are we are looking to see if it's possible to do that um, with the city with the city project on Pack Station South. Awesome. Thank you for that. And Councilmember Watkins, the, the fee is a moving forward um, uh, application. So um, depending on when uh, projects have uh, specified submittals, so um, we would likely have this apply at the building permit stage. And um, there have been some, some state law changes actually in SB 330. There were some provisions about the ability to um, apply uh, new fees once a project has been deemed complete. Um, however, and I'm going from recollection here, I believe that impact fees um, have an exemption related to that. So we could um, have that move forward. So if I'm recalling correctly, then we could have that move forward based on um, when um, uh, building permits are applied and not, you know, miss another round of, of applications that, you know, are deemed complete, say, today, but don't um, actually pull a building permit for another six or eight months or a year. Okay. No, that's, that's really great. Okay. Thank you for that. You're welcome. That's it. Thank you. Next, uh, we have Councilmember Brown. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the report and uh, the reminders of uh, all of the work that went into uh, the developing the housing blueprint uh, and report and um, all of the issues that we really spent a lot of time delving into and you know really getting uh, rolling up our sleeves and trying to figure out how to make some of these things work. And it's really nice to see um, how much has been accomplished. It's it, like uh, Council Member Matthew said, you don't really notice it um, as it comes to us in, in bits and pieces. And um, to have kind of this assessment is, is really great today. Um, I have two questions. And one of them, so I'm just looking at the, um, the matrix that you gave us part of the agenda packet. Um, and one of the um, one of the pieces under, uh, it's on, it doesn't have page numbers, so I'm, it's, um, so I have, my question just to, so you're ready, or one is related to legalization um, of uh, abated units. And so I guess I'll ask that one first while I'm looking for the other. So I, um, I, I'm wondering if, if it would be possible to just talk a little bit more about the work that's gone on there um, and uh, what some of the obstacles perhaps might be in, um, in how we accomplish uh, bringing those abated units back online because um, I have in, I've had the opportunity in the past couple of months to spend a lot of time talking with uh, people in neighborhoods in their home or at their homes um, near their homes and I've heard so many stories about um, folks who have not who have had issues with the rental inspection program or um, you know having their units abated for code reasons um, and there many of them on the face of them at least as they're explained to me seem um, very um, mild-mannered, um, uh, trivial almost. Um, and so, uh, but I, I know that there's always more to the story. And I also know that there are constraints that um, the city um, has, uh, you know, that give us, that limit the discretion that we have. But I, I, I just, so I'm just trying to understand um, without kind of going into details of any of the particulars of the situations, there were just enough of them together to make me feel like um, there's got to be more that we can be doing because, I mean, in in total, I've heard just in my own anecdotal kind of, you know, small end sample um, going around and talking to voters um, of, you know, these are like a lot of people have lost house, the rental housing as a result of um you know, being in um, uh, non-permitted units that are um, discovered. And it just seems to be like it's a continuing issue. Um, and um, so I, I guess I just would like to hear more about that work and um, 
the kind of the picture looks like for moving forward. Um, and this may be something for you know a longer conversation as an agenda item at a meeting in the future. Um, but I, I just feel like um, there's there's some there still feels to be some disconnect for me between the, what I see in green and the, as, as having made progress and completed all these things, but yet there are so many units that are still either um, have, you know, are, are, are just in limbo or people have had to move out, et cetera. And I, I just feel like it's, this is an area that there, we talked about it so much during the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee meetings. Um, I'd love to see more progress on that. Sure, thank you, Councilmember Brown. And, and you nailed the, the uh, issue in, in many respects. Um, one, of the, um, one of the big challenges that we have is um, that we do um, have the, the building code requirements that need to be adhered to. Um, and uh, one of the things that um, has changed since 2017 um, and 2018 when we were working on the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee is um, AB 1226 does offer more flexibility from a building code perspective than we had um, previously. That said, you know, what, um, what still has to happen in many instances is um, a substantial investment to um, bring something up to code, um, to establish that it, it was built to code. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, if, if you're coming in to build a new structure, you get your plumbing, electrical, structural, mechanical, you get all that completed, you get plans that are reviewed, um, and uh, the green building requirements, all of that is, is reviewed and then approved and then it's constructed. When you've got a building that's already been built, then someone that's trying to review the connections between the structure and the foundation, for example, you know, they may not be able to see those at all without going in and doing um, some uh, investigation, you know, tearing off one side or the other, you know, the exterior siding or the interior um, drywall and um, their costs associated with that. And sometimes it's identified that, well, it wasn't actually built to, uh, built up to code at the time. Um, you know, I've, I've asked some of our inspectors, have you ever been to a job where you didn't have any corrections and not a single time has anyone said, no, I haven't been to a job where, you know, I've been out there and haven't had any corrections. There's a checks and balances system in place so that we can improve the safety of these units and make sure that they are built according to plans. And oftentimes, you know, what we hear is, well, it was built according to code at the time, but then when they get, and, and the way that it works is um, for the legalization, they would have, you know, they have to hire those same disciplines that would have been hired at the front end. They've got to hire those same disciplines now to verify that it did meet the code at the time. And so, you know, I, I think sometimes the, the expectations are that, well, this has been safe, and oftentimes it's actually been um, inspected by our rental team. As, as council's heard from us over and over again, you know, we do our best not to kick people out. We, um, if we don't see any immediate um, life safety issues, we try to keep people in those units. Now, once we do that, that's a different level of standard than actually legalizing the unit. They may have to get someone out to verify all those things that I was talking about. You know, we may not see um, electrical hazards when we're out there because they could be hidden behind drywall. Um, but maybe you know the entire electrical wasn't done well, um, or done up to code. Or uh, similarly, you know, we may not see a, a plumbing challenge. Um, but when a, a plumbing professional gets out there to verify that it was completed according to code, then um, there may be some very substantial costs that need to be incurred in order to legalize it. With AB 1226, one of the things that's been helpful is that there is actually now a, a five-year stay 
um, on um, having to bring those uh, deficiencies up to code. And so that does allow for some uh, additional leeway and some additional time for people to um, uh, save for that cost um, that they may incur. Um, so that's been helpful. And then uh, the other thing that I would say is um, that you know, many of the things, as Matt mentioned, many of the things that we've done with ADUs, like just things like minimum lot size. You know, we had a minimum lot size of, uh, I think it was 4,500 square feet, but um, uh, don't quote me on that. In any case, there was a minimum lot size before, and um, due to state regulatory changes, there's no longer that minimum lot size. Um, things like the, um, the parking changes, things like um, the changes to um, the allowable setbacks um, for um, ADUs. A lot of these things have made it possible to legalize units that weren't previously legal. Yet, I, I do want to go back to the fact that even though it's possible to legalize those, you know, sometimes there's still a very substantial investment that's necessary in order to, you know, and I'm, I'm not talking about like a $10,000, you know, there, there's multiple, you know, multiple tens of thousands, and that could be for something that, you know, is um, in, uh, in the layperson's perspective safe, and, and maybe, but uh, from from an ability to habitate it in order to occupy it now as a habitable res, uh, residence. But for that legalization, even using the prior codes, which the AB 1226 allows us to do, um, could require significant investments. Um, so um, we have, uh, you know, we've brought uh, these conversations to the council multiple times, and um, what we continually try and do is um, is look at and evaluate the challenges that we see as part of that legalization program and see, all right, are there things that um, we could be doing to um, help uh, facilitate these legalizations that we currently uh, don't have on the books? And so um, a lot of those have been covered by ADUs, but there are also some other ones that are that are up and coming. Um, some of the slope regulations have the potential to, uh, some of the updates to the slope regulations have the potential to assist some unpermitted dwelling units. Um, the uh, work that we continue with the Coastal Commission to legalize some of the, um, the standards that the council adopted and that are in effect outside of the coastal zone still need to be effectuated inside of the coastal zone. And so all of these um, are uh, an ongoing uh, an ongoing opportunity and an ongoing challenge. Thanks. Um, okay, and it's a, a conversation that I'd really like to continue because a lot of the things that are going through my mind now, the specific examples, which I don't want to spend time on here, just seem like they, they, they still just don't fit into the, some of those categories. So um, hopefully we can, you know, just this will be an ongoing uh, yeah. work. Yeah. That'd be great. I'd encourage you, if you come across those, please send them my way and I can get them to the right people. Or if we if we say, hey, you know what, there's a code change that can help. I mean, even if it's one property, you know, we can wrap that in. And, and uh, I will also, just to close on this, um, I'll say that when we um, are looking at um, the legalization program, if we see the potential for changes down the line, we actually like put those to the back of the queue. And so we've had a lot of them that, you know, have come up and it's your turn to uh, go through the legalization process and, oh wait, you've got a roadblock here, but you know what? Six months from now, the, the state may be passing this law or we've got this on our work plan and that's gonna help you out. So we're gonna put you back in the queue and we're gonna take the next one. So we, we try to do that as well. And especially if, if we're identifying these new things that we know aren't gonna be online for some time. But yes, please reach out and we're happy to take a look at those. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my other question, and again, I'm scrolling once again, I forgot. Um, Oh, yeah, so um, this was related to the taxes. So it's number nine under in the matrix 
in the housing affordability and inclusionary category. Um, um, <clears throat> taxes, fees on outside investors is in progress. And there, I see a note here about, um, it sort of explains what that means. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of um, you know what what that means that um, so to be included in a comp compilation of options uh, to be completed in 2020 what's the timing like look like on that and you know what kind of um, taxes or fees are kind of are you all kind of what's percolating in the um, planning department I ask because you know I've been thinking and talking for a long time about this idea of a vacancy tax and um, it's you know, I'm just thinking of, you know, I think it would really behoove the city, um, you know, to think about ways that um, we can use uh, the tax and fee structures to um, to discourage the kind of speculative investment that is um, at least, you know, in a large part responsible for driving up the cost of housing in our community. And so, and so vacancy tax is one, but I know there are other uh, models that folks are looking at. And so I guess I'm just, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Um, you know, when to be completed in 2020, we're almost at the end of 2020. Um, and what, you know, what does that uh, entail? So uh, let me uh, jump in on that one because um, Actually, that uh, direction from the council, uh, I overlooked when the Blueprint Subcommittee report came out, and it just came back to my attention um, as a result of preparation for this meeting, so that's why it, you know, no progress has been made on it. That concept was based upon an ordinance that was adopted by the city of Vancouver, British Columbia, and, um, and they adopted a, a tax on real property purchases by foreign investment investors, in other words, investors who were not Canadian. Um, so uh, that was basically a discussion that I had with Council Member Crone back in 2018, and apparently it ended up on the Blueprint Subcommittee report, but I didn't flag it. So we're researching that, and yes, a vacancy tax is another thing that we're looking at as well. Um, there's a straightforward um, uh, possible option would be increasing real property transfer taxes because um, Santa Cruz is, is currently 0.5% like most of the cities in California, but um, several cities have increased their real property transfer taxes by orders of magnitude greater than that. So that's an option, um, vacancy tax. And I've also begun exploring uh, potential um, tax uh, options sort of modeled after Prop, uh, two, uh, Prop 15 with you know categories of uh, investment property or commercial property or vacant property that would be identified and, and it wouldn't be a real property um, and the Lorem property tax, it would be more of a parcel tax concept. Um, and so those are those are the options, and we're, that's an ongoing um, process right now. Um, I have not been uh, um, part of the meetings with the finance committee, who has been looking at potentially bringing forward tax options. But that was one thing that, um, you know, as a result of this discussion, uh, I thought would be a good idea for me to sit in on those and um, work with council members on on um, preparing proposals for the council's consideration to go forward. Thank you, that's helpful. Okay, uh, next up we have council member Golder. So I thought of this while council member Brown was asking her question and I know maybe one of the roadblocks for homeowners might be when you said it was expensive to do those um, upgrades that they would need to to bring their project to code and i'm wondering is there any like and i know we're not a bank but is there any way that we could work with maybe some of the credit unions or partner with somebody that has money that could invest to to help people get like low interest loans or you know i don't know you know something like that because i just know getting an equity line can be kind of hard for for people sometimes and um, so I, I don't know, I'm just trying to think of any way that we could help 
facilitate that so that it would help people bring it up to code, get it back online, and be able to afford, you know, the cost, the upfront cost. Sure, and um, I, I will call on Bonnie here uh, momentarily um, if she's got additional information, but I know that we have had some initial um, discussions with some of the local banks um, and looking at low interest loan programs. Um, and I had some initial contacts with the banks, but I, I believe that Bonnie's team um, picked up um, that progress. And so I don't know, um, that was pre-pandemic when I was talking to them, and I, I don't know if uh, what the status is, so I'll, I'll see if Bonnie has additional information. I don't actually have any, anything to add to that other than the fact that um, we have worked with local banks, and um, you know, I think a part of our challenge is having funding to be able to leverage with them. So some of the partnerships that we've been able to do with local banks, some of them have been their community reinvestment um, you know, uh, that we've partnered on for our revolving loan program or when we've been able to use our funding like the Economic Development Trust Fund to leverage and create like the microloan program that we did. I think we're always open to these opportunities and I do think that our local banks are interested as well. I do know that um, with some of the um, funding sources that were available through the CARES Act, they've definitely been really busy um, over the last number of months um, processing PPP loans and, and opportunities. But I think as we're looking long term, we're specifically going to be looking at um, our uh, $6 million uh, revolving loan program, you know, with that partnership uh, through the award by the Economic Development Administration and, and then our partnership with National Development Council to make some really meaningful loan opportunities available locally, but I know that the banks, um, local banks have a lot of interest and certainly expertise in this area. So that's something that we can continue to, to pursue. Because I know like once, like a house is under construction too already, or if it's, you know, has any kind of ta red tags or anything like that, it's probably impossible to get the financing if, if there's anything like that. Or the other thing I was thinking was um, like maybe offering like a percent rate reduction in the loan amount if you agree to do um, affordable housing for your ADU or whatever it is, like, you know, kind of like paying points or something, but the opposite, if that makes sense. So I'll uh, note that's, that's a great idea and one that um, we actually had some early council direction to explore in 2018. And um, I'm gonna see if Sarah Noisy is on the line here. She is. I believe, and Sarah being our resident expert on ADUs, uh, I believe that we um, cannot put any affordability restrictions on ADUs, but there may be a workaround from a perspective of a voluntary program, but I'm not sure. So I'd, I'd rely on her expertise related to that and see if she has anything to add. Sure. So I. Um in terms of what we are allowed to do, I mean, typically when, when affordable housing is created, there's um, there's some kind of exchange. So affordable housing is sort of considered like um, a public good or community good. And so in, in exchange for the community receiving an affordable housing unit, we're granting some sort of you know concession or waiver to incentivize the, the property owner to um, create that unit and like accommodate a, a lower level of rent, rental income. Um, what has happened now is that essentially the state, because the state law has become so lenient and so um, really kind of bullish in terms of um, pursuing ADUs and creating ADUs and really focusing on that type of housing as um, one of the key components um, in response to the housing crisis, we don't have a lot left to give. <laughs> so they're really just, the, we, we have very minimal site standards. You know, we kind of have a height limit and we have a very small setback and that's kind of it. Um, you know, we don't have affordable housing. So one of the things that we had discussed in the housing blueprint was like, well, maybe we can make this exchange for like, relieve people of, of the owner occupancy requirement in exchange for creating an affordable housing unit. Um, we looked into that and in the meantime, and we hadn't quite landed on, you know, what level of affordability would be right? How would section eight interact with that? You know, how do we wanna do this? And then the state law changed. And so now for the next five years, at least, we can't require owner occupancy at all. So that is, you know, that incentive wouldn't create any new housing units. Um, 
That said, the city does still have on the books a fee waiver program. So for units that agree to restrict their um, occupant and the rent that their occupant pays for, you know, I think it's in perpetuity currently, um, to various rental levels, they get a, a certain amount of fee waiver. So it's restricting it to, um, you know, low income, they get a partial fee waiver, restricting it to very low, very low income, they get more of a fee waiver. And I think there's, I think there's three tiers and that ex extremely low income, they would pay no fees. Um, the challenge with that program is that because it involves an exchange, it's essentially an exchange of funds between the city and a private property owner, a private citizen, um, it's a gift of public funds, which triggers um, state law requirements that all the work and all of the, um, yeah, all the construction labor would have to be um, tracked very carefully and would have to be paid at the prevailing wage, um, which just increases costs. And ADUs are extremely cost sensitive. These are one-off units. You know, there's no economy of scale with an ADU. Most ADU developers, property owners develop a single ADU in their lifetime. So this isn't something that where people, um, you know, are building, their developers building apartment buildings and they understand how to do this and they're, you know, building 50 units so they can make some trade-offs and like, you know, accommodate that different level of, um, you know, payment standard for their workers. So we have not seen anyone take advantage of that program since um, we got that sort of determination and ruling about, um, triggering prevailing wage. So that said, so the last thing I'll say on this <laughs> is the state did um, in 2019, they passed a provision that as housing elements are updated, they now need to include programs that show how we are, how they are, how jurisdictions are going to create affordable ADUs. So deed restricted, income qualified, affordable ADUs. Um, the advantage that we have in Santa Cruz is that our housing element is not due until the end of 2023. Bay Area jurisdictions are doing theirs right now. And so hopefully they will have some creative ideas and we can sort of, you know, have at least some menu of options within the next year or so. We can see what other jurisdictions are doing and sort of, you know, pull some ideas from there. So that's, that's what I have on that. Okay, so I keep raising my hand. I have one more. And by the way, sorry, I tried to clean my computer screen and I don't know what I cleaned it with, but I made it all blurry. So that's why I'm all blurred out. Um, so my other question is, okay, so you know how Housing Matters got those like pallet shelters. So is there like, and I'm sure there is because I've seen some, but like companies that sell like ready-made like ADUs that are just like pop, 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 pop. Is there a way that like, because that would be kind of an economy of scale, like where the city could purchase some and then sell them back to people or, or, lo or you know, finance them where someone could put in a foundation and plumbing and da 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 and have like a little plan and, and, and they could make, you know, payments to the city of $500 and rent it out for eight or whatever and make some profit, but, but as a way to, does that make sense? Has anybody looked into anything like that? Yeah, so, so there are private companies that have that exact model. In fact, um, you know, I think they, uh, the first ones that I saw were up in Portland and um, there have been even within the last month, more inquiries about um, uh, pre-approved plans. And so there are multiple ways that that's um, being done. Um, some folks are pursuing pre-approved plans so that they can take the same design that they have approved. And even though it's um, built on site um, construction, there's a reduced cost in terms of the upfront um, uh, design. Um, there are others who are actually doing uh, prefabricated offsite construction. And for those, there is, um, it's actually, they're actually inspected at the place of manufacture and they're given a placard by the uh, State Department of Housing and Community Development. And then there are certain things that need to be done when they bring it to, to place it on site. So, you know, we look at soil conditions and may uh, need a, um, a geotechnical report. Um, 
we um, make sure that the connections between the foundation and the structure are okay. We make sure that the uh, that there's adequate capacity from uh, for electrical, the new electrical load, um, and whether any upgrades are needed there, and the sewer connections and so forth. Um, so a smaller amount, but um, you know. A, we haven't looked at a lot of those. The anecdotal um, reports that I've heard back, um, and this is just talking to you know a limited number of folks in the construction industry, um, is that those also have uh, with them significant costs. That said, I think over the long term that um, there may be a, a higher potential for cost savings taking that route. I think because it's such a, a young industry that, um, that the costs per unit are still high, but I, I think that there really is going to need to be a, uh, a change in the industry and, and similar to what we've seen with, with taxi cabs and so forth. Um, at some point, there's gonna be a disruption and um, that's going to allow for more affordable construction. I mean, just in the last uh, six months, we've seen construction costs jump from $425 a square foot to $500 a square foot. And you know, if you think about a, a small ADU, even if you're looking at um, you know a, a 500 square foot ADU you're talking $250,000 right now. Um, and so um, looking at those alternatives um, where the offsite construction happens um, is, is something that uh, I think is gonna gain more momentum as the um, on-site construction costs continue to increase. There's no further questions right now from council. Um, we can open it up to members of the public. So if there's any members of the public who would like to comment on this item that's on our agenda, which is an update on the housing blueprint subcommittee rec recommendations, now's the time to call in. Once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when you've been called upon, you'll be asked to unmute your phone and you'll be given two minutes to speak on this item. Seeing no members of the public who would like to comment on this item, I'll bring it back to council um, for approval of the report. And I just also would like to say um, um, and give my appreciation for the amount of work that's been able to come out of the housing blueprint recommendations and the progress that staff has made. I think it's it's really great that you know we're over halfway through um, completing those recommendations and on our way to you know likely completing all of them. So um, I guess please continue to listen to how we can help support these recommendations moving forward. So with that, um, if there's a council member who would be willing to make a motion to accept the update and recommendations, we can um, move on to our next item. Council Member Matthews. Do you and have to call for public yeah. comment, Mayor? Sorry? Did you call for public comment? Did I miss that? I, I did, yeah, and no one, no one called in. Thank you. So I'm very happy to, move, yes, happy to move the recommendation for us with gratitude for everyone who has helped make it possible to this point. All right, so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I would give a second. Okay. A motion. All right, so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Brown to accept the update. Um, and at this point, I guess we'll, if there's no further comments, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers? Aye. <coughs> Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings. Aye. 
So that passes unanimously. Um, why don't we take a short break and reconvene at 3.40, and the next item on our agenda will be uh, data collection related to rental housing. So let's uh, reconvene at 3.40. So again, once council members are back, if you could turn your cameras on uh, so that we know that you're here, we can go ahead and get started with the last item on our agenda for today. Mayor, I just want to make note that it looks like Catherine has left the meeting. Okay, thank you. Hey, Rajiv, I'm gonna do a little staff presentation before we start your demo. Oh, perfect, thanks. Sorry, my computer crashed. I had to start up again. Okay. I think we're just waiting on Vice Mayor Myers at this point. So maybe we'll give her another minute. everybody's back so um, next item on our agenda this evening is um, item number three data collection related to rental housing so if there's members of the public who are streaming this meeting if this is an item you want to comment on now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen and with that uh, I'll just turn it over to our planning director Lee Butler uh, Sarah Noisy senior planner and Matt Van Waugh principal planner to kick us off on this item. Hi, good afternoon, um, council members. Um, I'm gonna rehash part of a presentation that I did back in February, just to kind of bring um, our new council member up to speed on um, what exactly it is we're talking about. And then I do wanna make sure we have um, reserved the bulk of our time to um, have a demonstration of the software that we've identified that would support this program should the city move in the direction of creating um, a a database of rental housing information. So um, let me just get this started and share my screen. Okay, so I'm gonna go through a little bit of background first. So recall all the way back in the 2018 election um, and this discussion sort of continued through 2019, we had this very heated debate locally um, uh, between landlords and tenants, and we had um, competing narratives of what was happening in the rental housing market and um, how that was affecting our community and the various components and people within our community. Um, it was very contentious. I'm, I'm sure even those of us who weren't on the council, council can recall that that was, um, it was a, that was a very hard time at the city, and there were a lot of people that felt very passionately in, on both sides of that issue. Um, the city council was, you know, identified that this was a real rift in the community and between the council and the community and community members against each other, there was um, sort of an initial effort to create a rental housing task force. We evaluated the feasibility of doing that. We had we brought in an outside consultant who specializes in, you know, conflict mediation, who we thought might, you know, facilitate a process like that if we went that route. Um, his analysis was that the city really wasn't quite in a position to engage that conversation in a productive way right at the time. So 
in June of 2019, the council um, passed a motion to you know, decline the option of forming a task force and directed staff to develop a proposal just to collect information about rental housing. Um, when staff initially came back, you know, we were thinking about you know, what do we have the capacity to run given our current levels of staffing and technology. We came back with a voluntary, a proposal for a voluntary program to collect data from landlords and tenants. Um, and that was sort of something we thought we could get our arms around internally. Um, the council was not uh, persuaded by our proposal and made a motion in August of 2019 to establish a two member subcommittee, um, which consisted uh, of um, now Mayor Cummings and Council Member Brown, um, and then direct city staff to um, direct the subcommittee to um, look into options, consider the existing technology that the city has available, work with staff to explore other options and look at um, other existing programs that collect perform a similar function in other cities in California and around the country and sort of investigate how they work and um, what lessons can be learned from those existing programs and then eventually to return to the city council. Um, we returned to the city council with the recommendation from the subcommittee in February of 2020 and the resulting um, action was a tie vote due to the absence of a council member. Um, what this means procedurally is that the item is neither passed nor denied and um, should come back at a future date for reconsideration by the city council. That reconsideration is not what we're doing today. Today we are just, um, my presentation right now is just to simply give you enough context to understand the software demo that we're gonna have at the end here. Um, there will be at some point in the future this item to, to either um, create a database or just be on the subcommittee will sort of return to the city council for formal action. So um, this is was in the, an attachment to your staff report. Um, this is the goal that was um, approved by the subcommittee, recommended by the subcommittee for, you know, if the city chooses to pursue creating a rental housing database, um, the goal of that program would be to, you know, create a complete and trustworthy data set um, that's useful to all kinds of different users, can inform city policy, um, and that would contribute to stabilizing the rental housing market. That's really the ultimate goal here. Um, also included with your staff report as an attachment are all the objectives that would that support this goal. So it's, you know, collecting information about the total number of rental housing units, um, rents in various units how things change over time. So all of that information is um, available as part of your staff report. Um, and the idea was that you could sort of watch things ebb and flow and change over time in response both to macroeconomic factors, state policy, financing availability, and local city policy. So we understand there would be a lot of influences that would you know, create the trends that we might be able to see in that, um, in that da database. And um, there, would, there would be some ways that that information could potentially be useful um, to city decision makers. So um, we have a more comprehensive list in your staff report, but just briefly, um, this could influence changes in our zoning code, perhaps to facilitate or pursue or even rezone property for types of units that we see more in demand based on vacancy information. Um, it could help us create some refinements in our inclusionary policy to better target specific um, specific income levels and household sizes. Um, we could understand that the state, how the statewide rent control is influencing our local market and identify the need for any additional local tenant protections, including eviction protections. Um, we could understand how much housing is, is owned locally within Santa Cruz city within Santa Cruz County, within the state of California um, and otherwise, and just sort of get a sense of who is, owns the property that we um, are responsible for within the city limits. Um, now, I, I wanna be clear, because this, is, because this program hasn't been created, um, you know, we, the city council hasn't determined, the community hasn't determined, staff hasn't determined what level of detail of this um, you know, information would really be made public. Would it be you know, aggregated citywide statistics? 
would it be broken down by you know census block group by neighborhood would we how much information would we be able to find out about an individual unit um, that has not been determined yet and i i don't want to make any representation here like we have decided about that and the programs that we've looked at elsewhere, they do allow some um, information to be shared about individual units. So depending on the level of detail and the, you know, what's included in that information that's available about a specific unit, there could be other ways that this database could potentially be used. So um, it, would, it could allow property owners and tenants both to do due diligence on one another and kind of view past rental history and behavior. Um, it could allow property owners to compare rents and determine, you know, as they're determining how to establish the rental rate for a new lease. Um, it would allow all members of the community, decision makers, community housing advocates, um, landlords, tenants, everybody to do their own research and anal analysis and um, bring forward policy proposals on their own to add into the mix and the conversation that we have here at the city. Um, it could also allow all of us to um, get a better understanding of housing market trends. Again, we do need to keep in mind that our trends locally are responsive to macroeconomic trends, right? Things that happen nationally, things that happen over the hill regionally all impact our housing market here. And so the analysis that goes into understanding any statistics that are created is gonna be really crucial to making sure that the, that the information um, that we take out of it is really useful. Um, and really reflective of things that we may have some local influence over. So I'm just really briefly gonna um, highlight um, one of the issues that we uh, ran into with the subcommittee is was sort of identifying like, how could we run a program that would really capture all this information? The city doesn't currently have a platform that is really geared toward tracking trends over time and creating statistics out of those. We, we use our land use management software for a lot of different functions. So we're really stretching the capabilities of that software platform. And one thing it really doesn't do is aggregate information for like a whole set of units of housing units that exist or properties even um, that exist so that you can draw some conclusions about that. It's really kind of clunky to try and manipulate that existing software to perform this function that we're thinking about. So as we were researching with the subcommittee, you know, talking to other um, jurisdictions that run some sort of rental registry, typically it's associated with a local rent control or just cause eviction um, program within a city or county, uh, not always, but most often, um, we identified that there was, they almost all of them were using an outside vendor to provide them with um, a technology platform to um, manage all of that information. 3DI um, was identified, we identified them as the most frequently used vendor of the jurisdictions that we contacted. So um, we brought them here today to, so they can demonstrate the capability of the platform and the software that they have. Um, and I'll just highlight using, there are some advantages to using an outside vendor rather than trying to build our own tech in-house. Um, they bring experience from other jurisdictions about just sort of knowing what's worked well and what kind of challenges have come up. Um, they have this existing platform, which means that um, you know rollout could happen faster than if we were developing our own tech. It provides the opportunity for a lot of self-service um, on the web for um, users of the service and the information, which um, you know could provide just a lot of benefits to the community in terms of not having to wait for calls back, um, you know, being able to look up your own information on a website. Um, it just seems like it could provide significantly better customer service than what we're currently able to provide. Um, it also allows everyone to have access to the information. So that's um, really important in terms of creating transparency about the data that the city has. Um, there's, you don't have to submit a special request to get the data, it's just available on the website. Um, so that's really appealing. It also, the, the, this particular platform is really customizable to needs, uh, if, you know, needs for this program may change over time. Um, it seems like this particular platform could be very accommodating of that. Um, so in the 3DI system, they'll talk more about this, but both landlords
landlords and tenants can access information about their property and um, register events or issues. I mentioned already it can be highly customizable. And one of the things that we've identified um, is that, you know, should we pursue this for rental housing data, there are some ways that it could be useful to our um, residential rental inspection service in terms of improving customer service and allow, allowing folks to, you know, track their inspections, register when they're ready for, you know, they've corrected a violation of some nature and they're ready to be reinspected. It could just smooth that process out and make it um, function a little better for our customers. So um, like any new program, there would be a financial cost and a bit of an opportunity cost for this as well. So um, included with your packet was the proposal that we got from 3DI last year. Um, so based on an initial estimate of about 15,000 total rental housing units within the city, um, the service that they're offering us would cost about $77,000 to initiate. So in that initial year where we're building the whole database and it's kind of estimated that getting the database fully populated would take about about a year. That's their you know experience um, from elsewhere. And then moving forward to maintain that database and you know accommodate you know um, registering events over time as they happen, uh, the cost would be about forty two thousand dollars a year um, to, over time. So multiple um, city departments would also be involved in um, initiating a program like this. Um, my department advanced planning, my division in the planning department advanced planning would be involved in terms of drafting an ordinance, um, you know, working with the community to like establish what are the parameters of the ordinance and what is the level of detail and what are the concerns and protections for privacy and how are we maintaining those. Um, IT would obviously be involved and um, finance would also be involved to, to, to some degree. Should there be a fee involved, um, you know, this is an LA of money, so fi the finance department would, would be um, included as well. So, um, you know, some of the work that happens in my section um, related to housing, related to um, um, some of our grant projects that we're initiating that would be affected a little bit. And then um, currently the uh, IT department is gearing up to migrate their land use man our land use management software to a new platform. We're in the process of sort of finalizing where that is going to land, um, and and that is going to be a big chunk of their workload. So um, you know this would have to kind of fit in with that project as well. So there are some kind of some work plan considerations. So next steps, as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, we are not here for a formal action on, you know, a yay or nay on establishing a data collection program today. Um, that will come back to the city council at some point in the future. If um, the council votes to create such a program, then there would be um, outreach by the city to, you know, like I mentioned, talk about um, concerns about privacy, the level of detail in the data, all the other standards, you know, we would be drafting an ordinance. So would, there would be all of that effort and outreach involved in getting all of those details just right. And then we'd also be working internally within city departments and with 3DI on, you know, establishing, getting all of that technological infrastructure in place so that we could, you know, roll it out smoothly um, at, at the appropriate time. So our recommendation with this item today, and then I'll take a couple questions and then I'll pass it over to Rajiv. Um, our recommendation today is to accept this report um, about the work of the rental housing uh, data subcommittee, discuss the potential um, for the program and the options provided by the vendor 3DI, and then identify a, a time to return as part of a regular meeting agenda to consider taking formal action on this program and the vendor contract. Um, so I'm available for questions. I thought I'd give some time for questions just on this portion, and then I'm gonna introduce um, Rajiv and Don from 3DI. Um, okay, thanks for that presentation. Um, Council Member Golder, and then just because of the, uh, in the, for the essence of time and in the sake of time, um, because we can't go past six, and I know that this was scheduled from one to five, I think it might be best if we hold off on the bulk of our questions still after the presentation, but go ahead, Councilmember Golder. Okay. Okay. All right. So it looks like we can just move into the 3DI presentation. And then afterwards, if there's questions, we can try to ask them all at once. Okay. So, um, so I'll just introduce. We have with us today um, Rajiv Desai and Ron Kristoff, who are CEO and um, Director of Marketing for 3DI Systems, and they're going to demonstrate their software for us.
Thank you, sir. And uh, thank you all for the opportunity. I'm gonna let me know when you can see my screen. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, what I'm going to describe to you today is really the platform that we developed uh, that has been it's a result of a lot of work that we've done over the last 20 years. We started the company 20 years ago working with a Los Angeles housing department when it was formed separate from the building safety. And uh, they have about three quarters of a million units uh, under, um, under management, and uh, they have various rental programs. And uh, they needed a system for just tracking what they do. And uh, we were software company selected to build that. And that program became um, sort of a, often considered a gold standard. Harvard uh, kind of called it the gold standard of housing management or whatever they call it, for rental stabilization and all, and all those things. And um, as we as we sort of over the years uh, developed more and more components to it, realized that a lot of constituencies require the same entire information. Uh, and so we said we kind of need a common platform. And of course, there are lots of variations in housing from, uh, you know, from, of course, due to the size of uh, constituencies and also, of course, uh, you know, different demographics and so on. So the housing programs, of course, uh, are all over the place. So we said, what do you make that actually allows that to, you know, and of course, how can you make data-driven decisions using that kind of a platform? So what I'm going to do today is describe what this platform does and how it applies in your context of uh, rental data uh, collection. <clears throat> So as I mentioned, uh, the, there are many, many programs, and these are some of the examples of programs that are currently running on this platform across various customers who come to several ones that use right now. So it will be rent registry, which is basically dental data collection, uh, to rent stabilization, to programs for homeless management, and how you transition that to accessible housing, all the way to NOFA, uh, where you essentially start from the funding spot uh, and then Good not sort of entire life cycle of, a, of an affordable housing property or project. And so, uh, and various customers uh, have use it in different ways, and, and I'm going to sort of cover that a little bit. But the fundamental sort of, uh, you know, the basis underneath is, uh, is really how you manage the rental inventory and how you establish that, how do you maintain that, you know, sort of uh, the, 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 as, a, as, a, as a reliable source of data and how you work with that. <clears throat> so. Um, we're going to talk primarily about rent registry, uh, and of course, these are all the programs. And of course, even as you were talking, I saw a lot of other programs that you do that, that could also be mapped into this. So there's sort of these four pillars of the system. The most important being the property inventory. Of the, you know, so property inventory basically is driven by GIS, but it has property structure, like you know, how many properties do we have, projects we have. What parcels there are they on? How is that connected to the county? You know, what, how many buildings on it? How many units in it? You know, what kind of even down to room level, you can figure out what's what, and that sometimes becomes important because you compare rents and such. I mean, how many bedrooms? How many bathrooms? All that kind of stuff. Does it have parking? Does it not have parking? So really, managing that kind of information needs to be in such a way that it works across, you know, a very wide range of. Of property structures that exist, uh, you know, and and you can imagine oh, there, are, there are homes and there are multi-story buildings to, to of course, uh, you know, garage conversions to everything. <clears throat> the, the other very important part about the property inventory is ownership, because ownership data is is complicated because the uh, county often is not always up to sync with uh, you know what's actually happening in the market. So managing the property ownership data, transferring the property ownership data, all that also becomes important. And then, of course, the occupancy types, you know, that changes sometimes, you know, it's a tenant, sometimes it's an owner, owner sometimes it's a, you know, depending on your, on, your, on your ordinances, you might have different types of use types uh, on, on occupancy that, that are allowed, not allowed. So, for example, there may be low-income housing, there could be affordable housing, there could be accessible housing. So how do you use these occupancies to really understand, you know, what you're, what you're and, and preserve the, the, the structure you have? There is actually a built-in CRM into the system that actually manages different contacts. So tenants, you know, owners, property owners, of course, and of course all the other people that interact with the system. So and it it can it ties very you know very tightly with the property inventory because after all these people live in those properties or own those properties so it's very tightly coupled. 
the third very important leg of this is the programs themselves. Now, one thing, when I say programs, it's of course rent registry program. How do you, how does someone register? How does someone seek an exception to auto registration? How does someone seek an exemption? There could be a program that manages elections. Some, there could be a program that's special for, you know, young families or something. So how do you, and programs are always evolving. There are new programs. The, the actual workflow of the program changes over time. And so we needed a system that actually could accommodate these things. And uh, as many of you have seen uh, across the state, you know, the rental properties have, of course, uh, uh, you know, been, been our, in our propositions all the time. And there are many sort of sub-programs that emerge and they sometimes disappear sometimes, they, they, you know. So, very, so, we, so what do you do when a new program comes, do you go out and buy new software every time? Or how do you kind of just keep, keep building upon what you have? And of course, there are other components like cost recovery. So many of these, uh, you know, constituencies actually use this as the basis for creating a cost recovery process, and and, and recover the cost of actual system also. And then there are other programs, as, as Sarah mentioned, that you might have rental inspection. So how do you tie that back to this or preservation? Preservation. How do you tie that back to this? And then the fourth pillar or fourth piece of that is, of course. You know, there are common components that apply across the thing, like you might have property code or code, you know, you might have self-service, so you have portals, you have, can people access it on mobile or not? How do you alert people of new new, new issues that might arise? How do you notify people? So there's sort of common elements like reporting, analytics, how do you integrate with the systems, and then, of course, security the data. So those are kind of the general four pillars that define the system. Now, the system is built with these three perspectives, of course, this is a rental, so the three primary sort of roles are the tenant, the property owner, and of course the, the city or the policy, uh, in, you know, or, or administration of this uh, from the city perspective. And then what I've got here are just some examples of what each can do or each might do. So typically a tenant might check the status of a property before renting. You know, like is this in control or not? Is this uh, or whatever the history is? And all that, that kind of stuff. Or they could verify information that, that let's say, a property owner submitted this says, okay, the rent is fifteen hundred dollars. I mean, is it really fifteen hundred dollars? You know, so they verify that. Sometimes they might have complaints or requests or so called arbitration that's required. You know, they could appeal a decision of eviction or something, they could report eviction. So you will see various use cases that actually can be done in turn. And of course these are just examples and, and I'll show you some where, you know, how some cities have used it, you know, as from tenants' perspective. From property owners' perspective, there are there are a number of uh, things that they can do. Uh, of course, the most important being that there may be an annual or as as the events happen, registering the property. Now, what that means is, okay, I've got a property. I live in uh, Santa Cruz. Now I've kept my property in there. I've got five units in it, and the five units have this much rent and so on. And who you know, you may or may not require tenant information. And then of course, where does it go from there? The rent changed. You know, what type of property is it? Is it exempted? Not exempted? So there are all these sort of tools to maintain and manage the property information as you go along. And um, and of course, uh, you have you have other information that might go along with it. So you can upload documents. You could, if you actually have rent, uh, you know, rent uh, rent civilization type of program where you have a fee, then they could also pay online. So it just becomes like a portal where you go and you manage your properties. There's a lot of other sort of specialties that come in depending on how your program evolves. There could be exemption management, there could be eviction management, there could be sort of board decisions on how do you dispute them or how do you sort of, you know, comply with them. Uh, I don't know, there are new, there are more, more sort of esoteric programs like tenant buyouts, you know, how do they work and, and of course, you know, how do you manage complaints. From the city's perspective, you've got the system administration side of it. You know, how do you manage different users, setting up different types of users, or maybe the issues like, can we create a special role where another housing agency can access this data? So for example, um, in Los Angeles, you know, we have a NOFA program which in the county and the city. So the NOFA program wants to have a view of what's going on in the rental stabilization program so they can share data like that. So giving access to things, how do you dig in? So city has all these other functions. Typically, city can also do all of the functions that a tenant and owner can do because many times owner is just not interested or even capable of doing it, and they might say I need some help. You know, so and of course, all the all the case management that goes with that can be done by the city, and a lot of it is really reporting, analytics, understanding how to project their information, and so on. So generating ad hoc reports and such, and of course, there's inspection components and that also ties in the city. 
Okay. So there, are, there can be various roles, there can be unlimited roles. So you could define the roles by directors, managers, and elected officials. Of course, uh, you know, the, the, the actual city policy uh, department and planning. And so, so you can sort of create roles and make the system sort of appear to them as, as, as in their role they need to, to have those functions. I'm going to give you some examples of where it's used and what they use it for. And then I'm going to come back and actually show you a demo. So we currently work with City of Los Angeles. We have for nearly 20 years. Uh, all the rent registry went in place about 15, 17 years ago. And uh, they use almost every kind of program. These are just examples of what they do. They have mandatory registration. They have manu mandatory annual fee. Their registration levels are north of 95%. I, I put 95 because they will say it's 98%, but it's just because some, some years when the new property, they're, they're, they're not there. LA County just uh, started that with us. They will actually go live in 2021, and that they they have about two million properties uh, to to register, mm -hmm. and so that's going to be uh, a more or less the same same sort of scale as Los Angeles City uh, is. And again, they also will have a mandatory registration program and you'll fee. And of course, right now we don't know the registration level mm -hmm. no next year. City of Beverly Hills also has it. They have no annual fee, but they do have mandatory, mandatory registration, and they primarily do is rent registry and some stabilization work and then eviction management also. They also have 95% registration level. Mountain View is, uh, you know, is a, has rent registry, so basic rent data collection. They don't have mandatory uh, requirement, and they don't have any annual fee. They have about 6% registration level. Now. They didn't, they didn't expect that. It's been two years, and the winter sort of coming up a little bit. But they realized that without actually requiring somebody to do something, so why would they register? You know, and what would be the benefit for them? So now they're changing that, and uh, starting January 1, they will also be on a mandatory registration process, which will actually hope, you know, definitely lift that. Berkeley, uh, which is just uh, we are in contract uh, conversations with them, they are, they are the oldest uh, registry in our rental uh, civilization program in, probably in the country, if not Cambridge, uh, is probably older in, in mass, but I think the oldest program in the country, uh, we've just begun working with them. And they also have mandatory, they also have annual fee, and they have very high penalty for not paying annual fee. So basically, they have very high level of uh, compliance. But the basic idea is that they've, been a very, they've got a very successful program uh, over, the, over almost 40 years. And, uh, and they, they also, and, and part of the reason they can do that is the amount of data that they have about the program. Alameda, also one of your neighbors, uh, they have almost all these things that are written there. And uh, they just started this year, and they are actually, I didn't put a number there, but they're actually right now at 95%, and this is their first year. Uh, and uh, they also, they began this, you know, this, it's not begin 2021, they, they charge 2021, but, and they've actually collected more in fees this year than they ever did in the past, because it's all online. So the Alameda is actually 95% also. And then Inglewood will start next year again. So what they're watching is that they're actually looking at each other's ordinance and seeing what's working and what's not working, what Sarah was saying, but we are fairly good. And this is just a couple of example columns. There are many other aspects of this program, and you can sort of see, oh, that tenant buyout sort of doesn't work, or maybe this kind of data collection is it doesn't really matter. So you can sort of watch that, and we, across a lot of different ones, uh, you know, we have information that we can we can certainly share. And of course, Oakland is is, a, is, is only uses the system for eviction management. They also started uh, last year. They also have 95% of evictions now in the system. Not just for this year, they go back eight years now. So they have complete data for eviction for eight years now in the system, so they can really do some other. I'm going to show you some examples of that. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to uh, uh, my browser here and show you how uh, how the system works and what typically is involved in getting the central data that we talk about. And uh, so uh, this is the exam. I'm going to use Alameda's uh, de you know, sort, of, sort of test system to, to show you. Uh, and of course, I'm going to show you some other examples also. So here, in the case of Alameda, you, know, you see two different logins, landlord and, and tenant. So one of the key things in developing the system was that it has to be super easy to use. If it's very complicated, then of course that'll be the first problem that people won't want to use it or they can't use it, and then it becomes ineffective. So user experience was critical, and we've now been doing it for so many years, and we found what sort of works and what doesn't work, and what people like and what people don't like. You know, so I'm going to log in first as the landlord, our property owner, 
and then I'm going to show you that how it looks from the other you know, perspective of, of the other users. <laughs> so here's an owner, and uh, they have to register. When they register, they, anybody can register, and then and depending on your role, you would actually, um, you know, you can sort of, sell. and you can be both a property owner and a tenant. It's not unusual at all. Uh, so I'll show you tenants by going to tenants a little later. So this person uh, is uh, just, Okay. Do something. Okay. Sorry about that. So, because this is a demo account, this person owns a lot of properties in Alameda. Uh, no, this is not a real account. Uh, so, one of the things we wanted to do was to actually have this ability to manage multiple properties. And it's not uh, not at all uncommon for people to have multiple properties. And then each property has this thing called property card. And the way you add a property is very simple. You come here, and, and when you start first time, there's nothing here. And you can just say, add property. And then you do that, it just say, OK, well, you know, bring your, uh, or, you know, because all this can be changed to look like uh, whatever you want it to be. So you have to go to your bill, so property bill, and say, OK, what's my, uh, what's my uh, a parcel number? So that's on your property tax bill. So you can just type in that property tax bill number, uh, or, or actually, this is a parcel number. And uh, then you, there's a PIN. Now, PIN number is something that the city issues. Uh, it can be issued, or it can be actually included in the bill itself. There could be some information in the bill that only they can have. And so as long as you have a property bill, you can get a PIN number and actually add the property. So let's verify that's a real property. So that is, and it corrected the address here. So that is the address of the property. And it goes back to the database and, and verifies that. So we actually start these programs by preloading them with information from the county. So we already have your county information, for example, most of those counties in the state we, we have we have information for. So we would actually, on an annual basis, working with your with your city, uh, be bringing in this data and also overlaying that with the data that you already have. And sometimes county has the right information in terms of units, sometimes it's actually needs to be augmented by the information that comes. And one of the first things that we we found was that Almost every city that I mentioned here, and many others, they just didn't know what inventory they had. I mean, you, you think you got 15,000, but when you actually start, you might find out it's 17,000, and, and or it could be it could be 14,000, and then that that estimate starts coming in, and, and people start sort of reporting things. You suddenly find out your inventory is actually a little bit different, and of course. The number of units changes a lot over a, over a period of time. You know, a city as old as yours, definitely uh, the unit counts would have would have shifted over the years since the original permits were issued. So, one of the things that happens is that that you start sort of getting that information. So, what I've done is I've gone and added that particular property, and now it's it's also in one of many properties that I supposedly own here. Okay. So, the the idea here would be that once you get a property, what do you do with it? So what I do with it is that I can add units. So I'll, look, I'll, I'll show you a property card and we'll show you what, what actually happens with the property. <laughs> Another thing that's worth remembering is it also tracks what past properties you might have owned. So let's say I owned a property and I sold it. Well, I might still have some litigation against it. I might have some pending rents against it, whatever the issue might be. I don't want to lose the data there, but I also shouldn't have any ability to change that data. Uh, you know, and I can pass it on to the new owner. There is some information that might be useful for my own uh, manager, so you don't lose the information. You actually can stay, keep the past properties in the system. Okay, so I'm going to pick one. I'm going to start to see if I can pick the one that I just added. Uh, bear with me. Sorry about that. So, I don't know what I did. Okay, so that's the property I just added. And it has, according to the, the system, there are two units in it. Okay, but I don't have any units in it added yet. So it just says, okay, and it actually has already names for these units from some past information that the information I have had. So literally, all you do is you go there and you can change various things, like I can change the contact information. I can add various types of contacts here. I can say, oh, I'm gonna add another one, or I can basically 
you know, create, uh, there's an owner type, there could, there could be a you know, property manager. So this kind of information you can add and, and change and modify over. And of course, often properties might have multiple site addresses. You might have a main street address and a side street address, especially if you have multiple buildings. So all of this uh, stuff it manages really well. So this thing has two units, one is a lower unit and, a, and a, an upper unit. So on a lower unit, I can kind of go and say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna apply for an exemption because this is actually not a not for rental at all. It's actually been, say, classified for exemption. So I can do that. So these all these processes, uh, you know, have to be managed from here. So right now there's no there's no information. So and again, each city does this a little bit differently. So I can edit this property and say, you know, this has got the same address as the other one. Occupant type is a is it vacant, is it manager? So you can actually see that you can pretty much follow the process. So let's say it's a rent subsidized tenant or it's an owner that's staying there, or it's vacant or whatever. So I can say that it's owner staying there, that's why I'm seeking exemption later on. It's got two bedrooms, let's say. But watch that if I pick a different kind of tenant, it'll ask for different information. So based on what I'm selecting, I'm collecting different data for that particular unit. So let's say the data tenancy started on a particular day, let's just say it's uh, November 1, and, um, and I've got a base rent of $1,500, and the current rate is also $1,500, and I can say that in you know, lasting fees is also on November 1. Okay, what do you provide with it? Parking, do you provide recycling, you know, and do you provide gas, up that's allowed? You may say, I don't want to collect all this stuff, and that's fine. So every, as I said, every city, every every customer of ours has a different form here. But whatever you decide, we can put in. Now, some cities say, we don't want to collect the names of tenants, uh, you know. So others might say, no, we absolutely want to know. So I'm going to put in my name. And of course, if there are language preferences and all that, you can observe now. This is basically, you know, and why that is, because if you have to, say, contact somebody, then you can use that. So I can add more information and so on. I can add more tenants. So essentially, I can maintain this information on an ongoing basis. Once I do that, I can start the process of registering this. So registration is literally that simple. You go through and you put in the information once. Most of the time, the information only changes maybe once a year, maybe every couple of years. The property structure doesn't change for years and years. All you're changing is one tenant came, one tenant left. One tenant came, one tenant left. You know, And so really what starts happening in the back, though, is you're actually beginning to observe how the tenancies change in various parts of the city, and that's what we're going to look at next. The other things that you can do, so this particular uh, customer does a lot of things. So, for example, now that I have this, I can actually say I'm going to, I'm going to apply for an exemption still on a contract. I can do a buyout agreement. I can do a capital improvement on this particular, and so I'm going to take this off the market and do some capital improvement. So I can make all these different requests to the city and communicate what I'm doing, and all of this is done digitally, so there is not a lot of paper going back and forth. And the idea is that I can actually create this. Now, if it was already rented, I would actually do some other things. I can also take the whole property and pre-seek exemption in this case, because that's one of the things that they allow. The other thing you'll notice up there is a little card, and what the card does is, in this particular city, for example, uh, they also charge some fees. So I'm going to, so there are various fees for various because this one has a lot of demo accounts. You can go and pay, you know, pay, pay, pay for a particular fee right off this. So a lot of times, you know, this is very convenient, and people just come and pay for it. And so this is just a normal kind of a kind of a you know account that that that, you, that the people the property owners will have and they'll be able to to work for that okay so once i do this what happens is that i'm going to go back and look at some other properties already been registered so you'll see what happens in that case i'm going to open this other property that has one unit and uh, in that you'll notice there is something called a case history below that so every annual cycle of rent registry creates a case. And the case basically is just a name or what it says is actually a record of what registration happened. So all the information is right here, you know, what was done, the copy of invoice, and there are any documents and stuff that I upload, it's all kept here. So over a period of time, if I made any capital improvements, if I did an eviction, all of that's actually going to be recorded and, and can be saved. And that's very helpful as you plan. So for example, let's say that here is somebody who I want to actually file a rent increase that's exceeding the AGA for that particular year. I can do that. Let's say I want to submit a no-fault termination. So 
so you can do that, but you have to tell me why you're doing it because that's not the state law. So I can come in and say, okay, I'm, I'm doing this, and I can create the whole process from here, and the whole, the whole eviction process can be managed from here. So let's say I want to make the eviction, eviction effective. This is the day I'm going to apply. Is it in person? What did you do? All that kind of, and of course, there can be all sorts of programs, and particularly in Alameda, for example, they have a relocation requirement. So if you if you move somebody out, you have to pay the relocation. What's that? Depending on the you know, occupant size and all that. So all of these processes, which are very difficult to manage, very manually difficult to do, are all now digitally manual. And they are and it's citing the ordinances and such. So it's 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 sort of very you know, and it's controlled. And, and degree, the degree to which you want to use it totally depends on, you know, and you, you can say, I just want registry, so I know all the data, or it could be much more than that. Okay. So that's, of course, from the side of the owner. Uh, what does the tenant see? So let's say I'm also a tenant in the same city, so I'm going to flip over. As a tenant, for most part, you can just file petitions for some decisions that have been taken. Now, that's Alameda. You might, you can make it so that, hey, tenants can find out about a property before they move in. You know, a tenant can find out more about, uh, you know, about the region, where, where they're moving into, what neighborhoods and such. It can be tied to the other information that the planning and others might be putting out. So you could actually look at this and say, hey, there's a unit exemption thing that, that was that was put in for my unit. So that's really, again because the demo data, so you know, some of this may be inappropriate for you know typically tenants don't to do that. So they would have some idea about about information like this. So I'm a tenant and I'm, I'm in another place. I'm paying fifteen hundred dollars, and this is what I this is what the the landlord has reported. So some of these cities will say, hey, can you verify if that's really the rent? You know, some cities say, no, I don't care as long as property owner told me that that's good enough for me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to log out and log in as this from the city side a little bit. And um, so let me do that. So what does the city see and what does city do? So uh, I'm logging in as a, as a, like a, like a uh, administrator of the program. The first thing is, of course, I see my dashboard of what's going on in my program. And of course, this could be different for each program. So you might have a program that's on affordable housing, side of the rental. There could be a certain special category of rental program. Uh, there could be uh, also just uh, in terms of uh, capital improvements. So here, it tells me how many cases I have of each type. And I can sort of dig deeper. So there are 12, 12 capital improvements uh, that are pending. There are you know, 1063 units that's in applied for exemption. So I can directly see what my city looks like. And you can say, look, I want at least this information to be visible to my elected officials so they can also look at what's going on, where they are, what's going on. We'll see in a second how. And then, of course, there can be other types of reports. And you can have extensive reporting capabilities that say, okay, show me all the ones that have buyouts. You know, what, and you can say, what, what are the status? How many buyouts are actually getting through? How many are defaulting? How many? So all this information can be, can be captured, and you can create a fairly detailed sort of you know, report on various types of aspects of your program. You know, whether it's registry, whether it's stabilization, whether it's rental inspection, all of that can be captured here. So, the, and this is all the, all the kind of all cases here. I'll quickly go to let's say that or some other property here, and you'll see that this is the same property that we registered, but you'll see a lot more tags on the top. The city is the same property than what a property owner might see. Because my role now is an administrator, I can I can have I might have taken a number of photos during inspection that I might keep. I might keep some notes on this particular one. I might also have correspondence logs. So I've spoken with the property owner, I've spoken with the tenant. So all those correspondence logs are also kept in the system. I might also want to see it on a map to see what's going on with the property, uh, you know, over time as, as the data comes from Google or some other place. And of course, the most importantly, it's something called a change log. So from the day you start, every every action that's taken by anybody, whether it's by property owner or whether it's taken by 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 the city, is actually logged. And this timeline really helps you to reconstruct what might have happened to the property over a long period of time. And you can compare this data and see what each region is happening. So this is uh, one type of data which you might do. I'm gonna, in, in just a time, I'm gonna switch over to a different one and show you how you can generate reports that are actually even more. Uh, so this is actually Oakland's, uh, you know, this is again not, not their data, but it's Oakland's sort of setup. 
So here's a database uh, dashboard that's quite different. So here what they're tracking is what are the trends and in, 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 in notices that they go out to on no fault evictions. So they can say, okay, well, it looks like most of these are notices, you know, and then of course some of these are broken down by 90 day, 30 day, all that. Where are they happening? You know, so they can have a number of data sets and say, looks like most of which zip code are most of the evictions happening. They can also look at it on the map, which I'll show you in a second. And so they can track what exactly is happening in their environment based on the data sets that they have. Okay, they can also do other data report, but their data report is all tied to eviction. That's the only program they're tracking. Again, underneath there is a registry and every single property in Oakland is actually in the system. It's just they don't mandatory really require anybody to register the property. What they require is that evictions have to be registered. Every eviction has to be reported. Just as that's, that's an ordinance. Here's something that uh, is coming up. Here's something that, that LA County uh, is using. Uh, this is their, again, this is just sort of various, various use cases that show you how, um, how data is used for, by various constituencies. So they use this data. They also have rent registry, which is going to go live very soon. Uh, and on January 1, they'll start collecting information. But they're tracking this is their preservation database. The, the long goal for LA County is they've got 2.4 million properties uh, that, that all together, out of which how many are at risk in terms of projects, how many are you know tax uh, tax credit properties that are like that. So I can just manage my tax credit program and see what is my current status of my tax credit based properties and how are they doing and where they are. So this is a much more sophisticated uh, use case uh, of, of you know of preservation database, and they can watch on a map and say, hey, you know, we don't have a lot of transportation, and all of our properties are here. So what do we do about that? So again, they're they're using this program for a very different use case. This is subsidized housing, so they want to see how their, their long-term subsidized housing risk uh, structure is. So they can watch the risk and say, look, we're going to lose 20% of our our properties because they're at risk. So they can watch the, the risk levels for various types of properties and see what they need to be doing in a planning sense to enable that. So that's that's another kind of use case that you see. Uh, and it's, very, it's also very effective. It's not coming up because I think I've got everything not on the same tool. Okay, so here they're watching these programs for uh, what are under construction right now, what are proposed, what is coming up and where they are, and they can sort of meet bring in other planning data and decide if, if that's that's going to actually be effective or not given where the where the, where the county is laid out. Okay. Uh, they can also look at the risk profiles for properties and see what's going to go, you know, what's going to happen with various sort of properties over time. So this is actually property by risk level, uh, you know, where they, where they are, which city has most risk in the county, and therefore they can sort of look at the budgeting and all that accordingly. So it's coming up. Uh, so these are all property at risk, what are high levels, and these are diggable, so they actually can be all, so I can look at the very highs and click on them, and I'll get the list of all the, all the high-risk properties. I can go through every single one of them and then kind of analyze that property. And that's important because now what you're doing is you're kind of researching this data and saying, what can I do with it? So now, once again, you'll see this property card that you saw before, but that was in the rent context now you're looking at it in a preservation database. So you know, someone like like Sarah's planning department could be looking at this and saying, all right, what are these different, pro what projects do this belong to? What are the tax credits on this program? So they track over, the, over 140 different attributes on every project from here. And of course, how, is it subsidized or not? Is it is there a TCAC program or not? And they can keep adding that over time. So let's say something was not a affordable housing property, but wasn't later on given some loan to to add some property or maybe convert some of the some of their property into an affordable program, and they got they can tack all that from here. There is and the last thing I want to show you in that context is this research tool. So here's a research tool that's very uh, now it logs me out. Let me find it here. Okay. 
So I'm going to do a property research. So here I've got every single property in LA County that's in the preservation database of the county. There are thousands and thousands of units in it. And so I want to kind of research that. So uh, I apologize for the, the, the loading because I think we're running video and everything. Let me turn off the video. So I'm looking at every uh, every affordable property in the LA County that's available, there's many, many of them. And let's say that I wanted to see which of the properties that are at risk and also are funded by the Los Angeles County. Uh, and of course, there's gonna have, and I can apply these filters. And as I do that, there are these five properties that are funded by them that are also at risk. So maybe they can take some action on it right away. So then I can look at that and then go to go to one of those properties and see what's going on with that one. And once I do that, I can actually go to the same data uh, to, you know, card that we saw. So some high level information about bond hours here, but I can actually go look at that property exactly like I was looking at the other part. So you can see that the core is the same. It's everywhere, it's the property card, it's all the units and unit information and so on. But depending on the use case of the customer, there are different use there are different use cases. So clearly, I mean, if your primary you know sort of goal is to just compile this data and understand how the rental markets are evolving and what's happening in in your city, you can do that. Uh, county here is looking at affordable housing also on top of that, and 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 they're also looking at the RSO, which is rent stabilization ordinance that they passed. So they're overlaying that data on top of that. So. This can really become a kind of a, ba a very powerful tool for managing housing over a very long period of time and also aggregate the information that's coming from various sources in the city, uh, from planning, from from building building and safety permits, and so on, and actually see how really the policies can shape based on the data that you take. So I'll stop here and, uh, and, 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 and see if you have any questions. For that presentation on this program, uh, I'd like to turn it over to council members to see if anyone had questions for Rajiv or for Sarah at this moment in time. Council member Golder and then council member Brown. Uh, my original question was a little bit answered regarding the fees, but I was wondering in other cities, um, if you said it, I didn't catch it, what the fee was that they charge, and I'm assuming that's to the property owner per parcel to cover the um, cost of the program. So, Consumer uh, Goldo, typically uh, that, that amount depends on the volume of units you have. Most of the times, the fee is based on number of units, not number of parcels. So, uh, if you have four, par, you know, it's per, per unit, uh, and it, it ranges from as little as twenty-two dollars a year to one hundred fifty dollars a year, depending on what you have. And so, typically, three to four dollars a month, all the way up to maybe ten dollars a month per unit. You know, it adds to the rent. Um, and uh, that's determined. So, the first year, most of these customers have gone and uh, done their uh, inventory uh, kind of assessment. How many do we really have? Do we really have 10,000 or do we have 15,000? Because that can make a big difference on one. And let's say, and against that, what is the cost of our program? If our cost of our program is, is requiring us to do, say, you know, uh, not two staff members or three, so what is the cost to run the program? So based on that, they would say, if this is a cost neutral program and general the fee based on that. And it ranges, as I said, from, in a very large program in Los Angeles, it's really not uh, not 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 as high, but in a, in a smaller program, it'd be a little bit higher. But typically, not much higher than I think it's eighty-four dollars, for example, in Alameda, which has yeah, which has five thousand or yeah, six thousand uh, units, which is very few. So they have to spread the cost across more. So I would think that with your numbers, it'd be lower.
Councilmember Brown. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I, um, I I'm a data person, so I I love uh, thinking about all of the the ways that this could be useful and and the you know the benefits of being able to aggregate data. Um, I am wondering, and this is, I'm not sure this is a question you can answer, but given that you've worked with other jurisdictions, um, I'm thinking you might have heard. Um, you know, one of the concerns that we've heard from at least several um, property management company representatives and landlords is uh, concern about this being a really onerous process for data collection. And um, so I'm just wondering if, you, you know, it, it doesn't seem that way to me based on what I'm seeing, but again, I don't have all of the information. I don't have, you know, I mean, and, we're, and we haven't even really begun to talk about what kind of information we want to collect. The, you know, there's so many variables, um, but how, you know, what has your experience been with uh, staff uh, from the jurisdictions that you work with talking about the, you know, the enrollment process with uh, landlords in their jurisdiction, if, if anything. So, um, so thank you for raising that question. And actually, um, I think generally property owners will say that hey, it's so hard and so much burden on me and so on and so forth. But of course, that has to be addressed. And so as you saw, I mean, I was able to register a property within, I think about well, half a minute. Uh, you know, it doesn't really take very long. It's actually easier than creating an account on Twitter. Uh, you know, if you know, so it's not that hard. Uh, and uh, the proof is not me saying that. Alameda started this March, uh, April, I think, uh, when they went live. By June, they had everybody on. You know, how, how hard can it be? And we have elderly people who said, look, I really don't want to create an account. There were other people who said, I don't have access. So what's, what often cities have done, they said, okay, you know, I think 85, 90% of the people are going to, really just go and register. It's really not that difficult. Others are gonna want some some assistance. So they will provide that sort of help desk type of a situation and then that would happen. We can also help out. But actually registration process is quite straightforward. Uh, I think what what they what people refer to is, hey, but you know if I have to do eviction right now, I don't I can just do that, you know, but you no, know, I can just send the letter to three day notice to the owner and I'm done, right? I'm sorry, the tenant I'm done. Well, this doesn't let you do that because you actually have to upload that. But again, I mean, I think we're all used to taking a picture or something and uploading. So I think that particular uh, that particular part of the, uh, uh, I think, uh, objection is now less and less real as more people are just used to doing these things. Thank you. And, then, and one more question um, related to uh, confidentiality and you know disclosure of public information of information that we receive that may be private but because being a public agency um, then becomes public information so um, and that has been raised as a concern I'm just wondering how you navigate that uh, with the other jurisdictions or what you know just kind of how that how that works so that's a great question so that, that comes up uh, in every single time and that, as it should. Uh, so there are really um, three parts to that. One is we never store any financial information when somebody pays actually goes to a, although our platform is compliant, we send it to the payment processor, just like when you take a parking ticket money, you, know, you don't really store that. So the financial information is never stored. You know, The second part is, portion is uh, property owner's information. So property owner's information is actually publicly available. Everybody knows who owns which property. So this is not, you know, so is unit information. The third piece is the tenant information, which actually is the most, uh, you know. so this platform actually is encrypted platform. Uh, we actually store everything encrypted from, and it actually meets uh, very high encryption standards. It is, uh, you know, it is sitting on Amazon, which also sort of further secures it. And so we have, a, and we've had 20 years of data I've managed in this, We've never had an issue like this. Uh, so, and every time we work with the city, we go through fairly rigorous, uh, you know, analysis of what the security standards are. Uh, the County of Los Angeles, they they put it through almost a month worth of sort of uh, what they call uh, penetration testing and all these kinds of things. So we go through a full analysis of the data security, and then the last thing is that 
some cities also take a decision to say, I don't want to collect this information, certain information because I don't want to be liable for it for whatever reason. You know, and uh, there are there are various sort of levels of that. I I think some cities will say, why do I need to know uh, this information? Uh, you know, maybe this is not really relevant. I just want to tenant one, tenant two. Others might say, no, I need to know the name. How do I contact them? There's some third, maybe I will take them as tenant one, tenant two, unless they choose to give me that information. So there is all this sort of levels of security that, that are fairly standard in the industry and we follow them. Thank you, that's helpful. Any other questions from council members? I actually had a couple questions for staff, um, just kind of based on what was presented. I'd just like to hear some of the staff's thoughts on, you know, how this could help with other programs like the rental inspection program, um, and how it might um, help in terms of, you know, informing policy or helping to preserve affordable housing in the community. Sure, okay, thanks for that question. Um, I might ask Lee to jump in here as well. Um, so as I mentioned in the um, in the original PowerPoint, um, there is some advantage that we see um, in using the system. If we move in this direction um, and acquire this vendor, there is um, you know, definitely some ways that we currently interact with our customers, particularly in the um, rental inspection service um, that, could you know benefit from a better customer interface, and that would certainly be provided by um, you know by the system. And it, it seems like there are um, you know ways that some of the um, the way that we do our work right now that could be improved a little bit, and um, and certainly made easier from the customer facing side of it because they would just be able to do so much on their own without having to you know actually make a phone call to the city and mail a check like it's 1996. Um, so you know there are definitely advantages there uh, for that. Um, in terms of you know. The, the software does a lot of very exciting things. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that, in, you know, from a policy perspective, we wanna make our policy first and then make the technology fit it rather than, you know, really um, diving full force into the technology and then building our policy around that. So um, that is something that, we are, that we're kind of thinking of, you know, in terms of other you know, there's like a 311 function that I think 3DI could offer, um, you know, in terms of, you know, public works. And, you know, we're not really there yet in terms of um, really exploring out those features. Um, and then, in so in terms of policy, um, you know, the way that this data could be used, um, I mentioned, I highlighted a couple of them in the presentation. Um, you know, there's also, um, you know, we we could get, so one of the things I was just talking about ADUs earlier, um, and we, we have done like a survey, we did a voluntary survey of ADU owners um, to try and get their rental data. One of the issues that we um, sort of grapple with periodically is how do we, how do we treat ADUs in our housing market? Are they creating affordable housing? You know, there's, there's sort of this, um, thinking that they are a way to create um, lower cost market rate housing, which we need. We need housing at every income level. We have residents at every income level. Um, and it's been really hard to get evidence that the units are actually used that way at, at a lower cost market rate. Um, we did get some information through our survey. Um, you know, we got data from about half of our property owners. So we can kind of, we can make an educated guess, right, about how these units are functioning in our property, in our um, housing market. And, you know, having that like com comprehensive data backup would be really useful in terms of like how we count them for our arena, how we make projections in terms of how we're gonna meet our housing demand at these different income levels. Um, you know, so that's, you know, one piece that comes to mind for me. Um, there is also, I think, you know, there's this um, sort of interesting potential for um, landlords and tenants to um, both sort of verify information so that we can ensure we're getting the same story from both parties at a rental unit. I mean, I think there's probably also, you know, challenges with that. Um, 
And, uh, you know, I, I, this part of the problem that we have had in the past that sort of, you know, I think led the subcommittee down this path was that we were really hearing different stories from different parties and, you know, the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle and this would at least get us part of the way there in terms of, um, you know, understanding what was happening in, in, in some individual units. So um, that said, I do also want to emphasize again, um, you know, our local housing trends are influenced by so many outside factors that um, pulling out what is really a local effect could potentially be really challenging. Um, and, and, you know, that is sort of something to, to keep in mind as we think about how we might benefit from this information. Lee, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate those comments, Sarah, and thanks for the question, Mayor Cumming. The, the one thing, uh, well, sort of two related things that I would add. Um, one, um, through IT's great work on mycityofsantacruz.com, uh, uh, or the app, um, we do now accept uh, rental payments um, online. Um, so, so that is uh, an improvement. I'll put a plug out there for those who haven't registered. Um, and then um, I, I just also wanted to note that um, you know, our, our permit tracking system, I, I will say that the residential rental inspection service um, does not fit, fit neatly within our current permit tracking system. And um, as Sarah mentioned, this, um, this system could offer some um, improvements to how we do business there. The, the thing that I wanted to mention is that um, that current system is actually, um, they are phasing out the service for that. It's, it's quite old and they've been trying to get us to upgrade for years and um, there have been um, some challenges that IT has had, um, some significant ones recently where our e-track it, which we've relied on heavily during the pandemic, um, has had to get taken offline because of uh, challenges and that seems to be happening more and we're getting less um, support from the vendor. And so we are pursuing, we are actively pursuing a new permit tracking system. Um, and so, you know, some of the, and, and so it's, there are some uh, uh, benefits to having the, the residential rental inspection service in the same uh, system as say, um, the code compliance and even, you know, the current planning. Um, so, so there may be, I just wanted to point out that there may be some opportunities for um, some of the improvements that, um, that this system offers, you know, could also be um, obtained through another system, the, the larger permit tracking system upgrade that we are um, going to be pursuing and um, that we're, we're narrowing in on now in terms of uh, how we want to uh, and who we want to go with for that. Um, so I just wanted to, to point that out because, um, you know, the, the real benefit that I see of this uh, 3DI is in relation to the, um, the data related to um, rental housing. You know, I would not expect um, that a permit tracking system has the same types of capabilities, you know, they're, they're somewhat, it's somewhat of a different animal. The permit tracking system is, um, you know, really uh, functioning as something that is like carrying a, a, a building permit or a planning permit through the process. And that's how it's designed. 3DI has kind of designed their system for um, collection of and um, the um, analysis of rental data. So, um, you know, there could be some additional benefits related to the residential rental inspection, but I also want to be clear that, you know, we may, we may pursue a different path for that in and of itself. And um, the, uh, I, I would not see the vice versa necessarily uh, happening. I wouldn't see us using a new permit tracking system for the rental data. I just, I don't think that they're really made for that in most instances. Um, so I just wanted to put that sort of balancing act out there for the uh, council to understand. Uh, we'll go with council member Matthews, then vice mayor Myers, and then council member Watkins. Well, 
obviously there's a huge range of what might be done with this in great depth. And um, um, some of it, as Lee just said, um, over, could overlap considerably, especially a newer um, permit tracking system that the city might get into. It would seem to be premature to me to go deeply with this proposal rather than kind of open up the RF DQ for a whole permit tracking um, system revision. Um, if that's the need, and so it does seem like there are two different functions. Um, I had, uh, I guess this is just a technical question. Uh, we were given a price for a setup and a maintenance, and I guess that was based on a rough estimate of how many rental units there were in the city of Santa Cruz, uh, and then there was a a circle with four components, or maybe it was three, and one was the, the staff and the input that the staff had to put in, if I'm recalling that um, slide. So I guess my question is, uh, for let's say initial setup fee and annual maintenance fee, who's putting in all that data? And that, that absolutely depends, I would imagine, on how much data we're expecting. If it's a whole permit tracking thing, then it's a big burden on staff, so it's not just the and the maintenance fee, it's all that stuff, staff time putting in the data. So it seemed to me that um, there were a lot of questions to what are we getting for this and how much is it costing and is this the best way to get this information. Um, I do have uh, real concerns about the privacy issues of this. I think I've raised this before, so it's no question, um, no secret. Um, I have a good deal of uneasiness about, um, because the potential is so vast on this, we might say well, we're going to start here and then it morphs into something that um, may not at all be um, what uh, council thought they were signing up for in the beginning. And um, again, no secret, I do have a small rental property and I'm not going to be around the boat. <laughs> so I'm just going to lay that out there. So, those are my concerns. They're probably shared by other people. Um, so that's, that's it. Just want to say a piece there. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. You're muted, by the way. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, some of my comments have been made, and I, uh, I appreciated your question for the staff and, and the thoroughness of their. Um, their response. Um, I guess one housing stock that I think actually has quite an influence on our sort of overall sort of housing ecosystem is um, sort of the trends up at the university. And so I'm, yeah, I'm just, I, I feel, I think it was Sarah's comment, we have such a complex sort of regional situation with regards to our housing situation. Um, but um, so I'm kind of leaning, yeah, I, I'm very, very appreciative of the product, so I, I, I will cook on it, but I, I, I do think that um, uh, whether it's, I also appreciated Sarah's comment in terms of, you know, the policy setting the product instead of the product um, helping us, you know, so I think that's another thing that we really probably need to think through, but I appreciate the work of the subcommittee and um, very much appreciated the product uh, review today. Um, it does seem like the product is very, very helpful in, you know, the management of, of obviously, if you're a jurisdiction where you are managing affordable units and you're you're sort of managing your own stock. I can, I could see potentially, but you know, we don't have a lot of that. I don't know how much we would have moving forward, but um, I could, um, I could see sort of a potential in terms of maybe just an internal tool, but um, the broader application, I'm not as clear um, in terms of uh, really assessing the community and the regional sort of market and the um, ability to track all the various factors of that. So I am, thank you very much for the, um, for the presentation and uh, really interesting product with lots of interesting uh, applications. So thank you. Councilmember Watkins. 
Uh, thank you. I, I, I sort of echo uh, Vice Mayor Meyer's comments in regards to the product and the interesting elements that you can use to kind of aggregate and disaggregate various data points and then applying it based on um, sort of what the ultimate goal and outcome of the data we hope to have accomplished. Um, I have a question though for the staff and you you mentioned that the original um, proposal was, and I, I apologize if I forgot, but was to have sort of that internal database uh, created um, at a voluntary, was that something that you would need to contract for or is that something that you felt internally within the city we have capacity to, to do and, and manage? You're talking about um, the first um, staff proposal about a rental database? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let's see, that's that's going back in time a ways. Let's see if I can recall all the detail. Um, so when we brought that proposal back last summer, um, we were trying to come up with a program that we as staff felt we could manage, right? We As staff, we had never run a program like this. We'd never attempted to create a database um, of this magnitude that would ultimately generate statistics, um, you know, and sort of initially we were like, well, maybe it's just really simple and it's kind of like a Google spreadsheet that we like import into Excel and we like quarterly pump out like five statistics about the housing market, like maybe that's all it is. Um, so there, there's two pieces of complication with creating a database like this. One is the breadth of it, like how many units are we including? Because, um, you know, as the subcommittee has sort of um, currently proposed and envisioned this, um, the idea is to count, capture every rental housing unit. So the residential rental inspection service that serves about 11,000 units doesn't serve every rental unit, right? It doesn't serve ADUs where the owner lives on the property. It doesn't serve uh, mobile homes. It doesn't serve you know room rentals if the owner's living on site. Because the idea there is that um, that service is really focused on property maintenance. So the assumption has been made by the city that the property owner lives there, they are taking better care of their property. If it's a mobile home, it's subject to a different building code and it's not even subject to our local city code. So we don't have really anything to enforce about those units. So we don't track them in, as part of that service. The idea with you know, collecting this information, since it was more about you know, the, the market, um, is that we would wanna capture those, right? So that's one piece. Room rentals is you know, also included there. So we, it's a bigger pool of data points, so like 15,000 data points potentially. Um, so there's that, and then, and then, so that's sort of the breadth of it and then the scope of it. So what pieces of information are we gonna collect? Are we really just gonna collect like, yes, it's rented, this is the rent. Like if that's two pieces of information, that's sort of like one scope of work. If it's, you know, as currently we've sort of envisioned it through the subcommittee, it's, a lot of details about the property, like how large is the unit, how many bedrooms does the unit have, what's included with the unit in terms of amenities. Um, you know, like like Rajiv demonstrated, you know, you provide parking and gas and you allow pets, you know, all of those things which affect rent. So there's a lot of information that would be collected to give context to the rental amount, right? Um, that's a very different scope than um, what we had initially proposed with like a voluntary pilot um, because also, you know, our thinking last summer was, you know, we'll start with a pilot program and we're gonna learn a lot because we don't know anything yet. And um, we're gonna learn how to do it. We're gonna learn what's not working. We're gonna learn like our limits, uh, you know, as a organization. Um, and, you know, ultimately that didn't really meet the desires of the council at the time. And so um, that's kind of, that's what initiated this process of, you know, establishing a subcommittee, doing further research, um, you know, and finding something that could meet sort of the expressed goals and desires of the council. Okay, thank you. I had one quick question and then um, just in the essence of time, we should probably move to um, public comment. Um, and this one's for Lee. I just wanted to know if you could tell us again, I know earlier this year when COVID hit, we were trying to get a sense of um, how people were being impacted. And I know there was a survey that went out and I'm just curious how many people filled that survey out. Ooh, I'm, you know? I'm gonna go from memory here. Um, 
My recollection is it was around 900 or so, but I'm going from memory. Um, I can dig that number up, um, but I think that's uh, uh, it's ballpark. Um, if you want to, um, if you want to uh, wait until after public comment, I can find that number for you. Okay, that's great. Um, are there any further questions or comments from council members at this time? Okay, hearing none. Um, if members of the public are interested in commenting on this item, on this item. Um, now is the time to call in using the numbers that are displayed on your screen. Uh, once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And uh, you'll be asked, once it's your turn to speak, you'll be asked to be unmuted and you'll have two minutes to comment on this item. Hey, uh, Reggie calling again. Um, I, uh, I really liked uh, this presentation. I really like uh, all the robustness around it. And I like staff's idea that it applies to um, more than just sort of regulated, traditionally regulated units. Uh, so, because during this time with COVID and the sort of patchwork of state, county, and city protections against evictions and large rent increases, I feel like we need tools like this to enforce those rules. Um, and it's not like purely hypothetical. Uh, I've been sort of canvassing affordable housing throughout the city during this election season. And I'm just hearing like really concerning things from tenants. Uh, there were some tenants um, who are veterans living in low income housing and they were asked like informally to pay increased rent to offset other COVID vacancies in their apartment complex. And that just seems like nobody is sort of like watching that kind of thing. I heard about some new management at affordable housing Casa de, uh, Del Rio, which is on Blaine Street. Um, and then they're asking tenants to temporarily relocate during a pandemic so they can renovate units, which they haven't done in like 40 years. And so just, these are just very concerning um, things that I don't know what they could lead to, you know? Um, and I don't know how we're enforcing like the laws that we actually have on the books right now. And so, um, yeah, I, I just would really like if we could sort of push this along, um, particularly during COVID, just to sort of have something in place to make sure that uh, these new property managers and you know bigger landlords um, of more sort of slumlordy property are really just like following the laws as they are today and not sort of informally evicting people, informally raising their rent, which it seems like that may be happening. Uh, yeah. Thank you for those comments. <clears throat> if there are any other members of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item, Now's the time to call in. Uh, once you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and you will be given two minutes to speak. Okay. Um, Seeing no other members of the public who would like to uh, speak to us on this item, I'll bring it back to council um, for action and deliberation. Mayor, uh, I would just uh, let you know, 800 is the number of response. Okay. Okay, so, um, Looks like the current recommendations are accept the report on the work of the rental housing data subcommittee, discuss what we discussed the um, this app, and then the third item was identify time to return as part of a regular meeting agenda to consider taking formal action on the proposed data collection program and vendor contract. Um, so I don't know if that if there's a council member who'd like to make a motion. Um, it could be that we bring this back with. Um, you know, the, the number of projects that we're considering for the um, interim recovery plan. Um, 
but yeah, I'll, I'll just put that out there as a, as a example. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I was gonna um, suggest that maybe, um, I think housing with the housing did come, um, I think we could tuck this into the, into that interim recovery plan, but I, I'm not hearing a ton of support. So I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I think we could have another conversation possibly uh, via the interim recovery plan uh, process to see if we're narrowing this in for some use that we can identify through that process. Um, specifically, I think during the COVID period. So um, it's it, to me, it's a costly product. Um, and so I'm just trying to, trying to understand sort of the, the, the piece in it, but I, I personally, I think that would probably be the only place right now to fit it in, in terms of continuing the discussion. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to listen to, uh, to other members' ideas, uh, or I could, uh, I'm happy to make a motion if need be. Okay. Uh, Council Member Watkins and then Council Member Matthews. I am, um, no, I appreciate uh, new mayor and, and vice mayor mentioning the potential to kind of integrate it into our interim recovery um, approach because we do know that we have um, very limited resources and are financially constrained as well as um, thinking about the prioritization of the various uh, trade-offs that were referenced at the beginning of the presentation. So I do think it's part of that bigger conversation. Um, and so those, those are essentially my comments and, and if, if Vice Mayor wants to make a motion, or I see Martin Bernal is on here too as well, if he wants to speak to that. Yes, I was just gonna mention that uh, we're scheduled to bring back the uh, interim recovery plan uh, formal approval on the 24th of November. So not, the, not Tuesday's council meeting, but the one after that. And then just by way of background, the, the three items that you uh, adopted as the three priority areas were uh, take action to ensure short and long-term fiscal sustainability, investing in downtown and other business sectors and improve and maintain infrastructure. So again, but this will all come back to you so you can review it on the 24th. Thank you. Council Member Matthews. Maybe the planning director could comment on this, but what I heard was that our um, permit tracking, existing permit tracking system was headed towards a crash and burn situation pretty soon. And that, I mean, you must be moving forward on that, looking forward, looking for RFP, RFQ, whatever, to, to um, develop a new system for that. So maybe you could speak to that. That seems um, more immediately urgent me. Sure, so we um, we did complete, uh, I believe it was last year, a um, mini RFP to get an understanding of the, um, the, the costs associated with the new permit tracking system. And um, we've since been engaging um, the uh, new owner of our current permit tracking system to understand what they can offer um, in relation to um, the, an upgrade of their system. And uh, I'm sure Ken can speak way more eloquently than I can about the uh, IT challenges with, uh, that, that you've had recently. Yeah, just now we're approaching uh, an eight to 10 year old system and we've uh, stumbled across some vulnerabilities, especially with our public facing website that uh, puts us at risk. Uh, a lot of the uh, current system is antiquated for the, some of the most of the business processes that are taking place in our planning and, and public works division. So uh, we've been uh, trying to get to a point where we could upgrade. We've had some staff resources and uh, some of the growing pains with the change in vendors of our, our current system. Uh, we, we're, we're realizing a level of stability now. Uh, it's the most uh, cost-effective path is to do this upgrade. So we are, uh, we had a kind of a, a kickoff meeting with a consultation vendor that's gonna help with some business process review, but we're, we're well in the mode of moving towards a, a new platform and it is absolutely a priority given the age of the system and the vulnerabilities uh, that we're, we're kind of encountering. Well, um, that kind of makes my point. And I guess the thought would be, are there aspects of the um, 
the huge menu of opportunities that were presented today in, in this program, but are there aspects that you would want to incorporate into, the, into any revised permit tracking period without adding on another whole system? And that would seem to be, you, you have your most immediate needs to meet, and then some other questions that people have about tracking ADUs, whatever. But, um, that, that's what I would look to first is is getting our our core permit tracking functional and adding to that the things that we most want to know about our housing stock. And I, I also just have to say I completely agree with Sarah's comment about there's so many just massive external forces on our housing market. There are a whole lot of things that obviously we are not going to solve single-handedly. Ken, I don't know if you want to speak to that um, or Lee. Specifically, the question is, are there additional services that we could add in the in Well, that, that, in my mind, that would be the, the first path is get, get the things up to speed that you need to get up to speed that you absolutely know about. And then if there are elements of the um, housing stock or something that can be incorporated into any revision, that might be the most cost-effective way. Gotcha. And so specifically around rental inspection, that was a question that came up yeah, when, exactly. when, yeah, when we did our conversation. And uh, I think the implementation that we're currently sitting on is, is poorly constructed and uh, was customized into the application. So mm -hmm. they have, they will uh, be doing a business process review specifically of rental inspections and making some recommendations to see uh, if there's a, ba a way to better construct it in a land use management software system. Yeah. Uh, but to Sarah's point, this would not satisfy necessarily a rental registry registry system. Right. Yeah. yeah but the inspection and system, we are looking. We definitely would like to, to contain it in one system so that you know both IT staff and planning staff are not using uh, you know disparate systems to to mm -hmm. do the, the same tasks. Yeah. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. You're muted, by the way. Doing today. Uh, I I I'd like to go ahead and make a motion that we, based on the interim recovery um, recommend final recommendations and mid-year budget update, we defer any further action on this item until uh, the second meeting in January at the, at the earliest and revisit the item then. Um, so that would be my motion. And I guess my follow-up comment is, comment is without really understanding our budgetary issues um, without, you know, prior to mid-year check-in, I, I just think, I think this is unfortunately a project that just needs to be sort of pushed back and um, reconsidered at another time. Okay. We have a motion by Vice Mayor Myers, uh, Council Member Golder. Um, I'm willing to second Council Member um, Myers's motion. I just also wanted to add that I just am, am concerned about moving forward with this at this time based on our discussions at the last meeting, I think we put a lot of effort into making sure all of our arrows are flying in the same direction in, um, in our economic recovery period that's coming up and it's going to be difficult. And while some things, you know, seem really important, not every, not every, we can't do everything. Everything can't be important. So, and I know um, there's a slight cost and I say things like a lot. There's a cost associated with this that I just wouldn't feel comfortable with at this time. So that's why, I, yeah. And I'll second the motion. Okay. So a motion made by Vice Mayor Myers, seconded by Council Member Golder, um, to defer action on this item until the second meeting in January. Or. I think I'm missing something from that, Vice Mayor. 
I think I'll just, let's just keep it easy. Let's defer it um, until after mid-year budget update. Councilmember Matthews. Would the maker and seconder uh, include also um, an update on the uh, process of uh, improving our IT permit tracking system? Yes, I'm comfortable with that. Motion by Vice Mayor Meyer, seconded by Councilmember Golder, with additional um, the friendly amendment made by Councilmember Matthews to defer the action on this item until after the mid-year budget update, and also receive an update on it, improving um, permit tracking system. So, if there's no further, are there any further comments from council members at this time? Okay. Hearing none, I'll turn it over to um, our clerk to call the roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Byers is absent. Um, Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cutting. I, and I'll just say that um, I'm hoping that at the next meeting we can um, create a path either to continue forward or um, we can make a recommendation on which direction to go in. I will say that I do think that this kind of information is going to be really important for us to be tracking um, moving forward, understanding the number of evictions and, and when how our housing is shifting in the town is going to be extremely critical over the next, you know, 10 years plus. So, um, but with that, uh, the, that motion passes unanimously, and that brings us to the end of our meeting. And so, uh, just so members of the public are aware, um, we do have a regularly scheduled city council meeting next Tuesday, but we will also have another uh, study session focused on mental health crisis response on. Uh, November 16th from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. And Councilmember Matthews. I, I want to say I know this is an issue that is personally very important to you, and um, I do appreciate your, all the energy that you particularly put into this. And I also appreciate that this meeting was able to incorporate the state legislation update. These things are also wedded in together, and that we did take time to look at the um, uh, progress on the housing blueprint. I, I appreciate that this issue was made to be more inclusive. So thank you for structuring the meeting that way. No problem. And thanks for the recommendations as well for having those items included. Mm -hmm. And with that, uh, we'll adjourn our meeting. Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>